We're going to have some. So we're not going to have a monitor. Is that what you're saying? That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. And Mary, you've got the two minutes. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, you might want to create a promotion at two minutes. Okay. Okay, I would like to call this meeting of the Cincinnati Board of Park Commissioners to order December 16, 2021. Let the record show that all of our commissioners are present for our last meeting of the year 2021. Thank you all for being here. First, we've got some uh, speakers who would like to speak to us. Again, we've got quite a few and we've got a very lengthy agenda today, so we are going to limit you to two, mi two minutes, and a beeper will go off, and please excuse us, but we're going to say thank you for your comments and uh, call the next person. So first, we have Maureen France, who would like to address um, our item on Gallagher Park. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, um, I'm a trustee on the and Heights University Heights Fair of the Community Council, Cuff, better known, and I'm speaking on behalf of the trustees to support the application um, to change class in part to Paul Gallagher Park. Um, Paul, often referred to in our neighborhood as Tree Man or the Tree Nut, <laughs> is a remarkable man, and he has planted and cared for thousands of trees in our community over the last 50 years. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Classen Park. It's not a real big significant park, but it's significant to us because it sits at the gateway of our community right next to St. George, which many of you saw the fires eight, in 2008 that were on fire. You can see them all over the city that have since been replaced. So um, Paul, this became a park in the mid seventies and Paul has always taken on his personal Park, he calls it. And even though at 94, he goes there almost every day to check it out and see what's going on, if anything needs to be done, and there's always litter to pick up. So it's an especially significant park for him. So given this is my tall green chair, um, and you all have seen this because it you know, came as your package, so I might uh, reiterate it. I just want to say that and over the years, besides taking care of it, you know, it does provide a um, green space for the children from Corrigal Catholic and from our like, preschool, they use that park. And it's just a little, you know, oasis in a very busy intersection. Also of note, um, years ago, the Cuff residents made a series of um, planners, mosaic planners, and one of them has a fire hat, which um, honors Paul, who was a firefighter at Corrigal Station for most of his life. So, um, and also in addition, because it's appropriate here, I guess that property was a few, several years ago was being considered to be sold off. And Paul got wind of it and came to me, I was president of Cup at the time, and I wrote a letter. And he dramatically came here and presented it to the, the board at the time, and it was saved. So, anyway, I just wanted to say, you know, we just want to support. He's, we're just so blessed to have him in our community. Thank you, thank you, Maureen. Thank you. And it may be a small park, but there are no insignificant parks in the Cincinnati <laughs> park system. Thank you. Uh, Linda Ziegler also wanted to comment on Gallagher Park. Hi, my name is Linda Ziegler. I'm the president of the Cuff Community Fund, which is a small not-for-profit that's existed since 85 or so. Uh, it was brought about by uh, Multimedia, who owned the broadcasting tower of Munchen. And Paul Gallagher was one of the original trustees that made that happen. Since then, we have spent a lot of our funding planting trees with Paul. And I personally have been planting trees with Paul, I think, since 1985. Mm, he's, yeah, he's an amazing guy. Um, I just wanted to say on behalf of the, uh, we call it the Tower Fund, uh, we need to in some funding for a new sign um, to rename it Gallagher Park. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your volunteer work. Thank you. Cuff is a very active neighborhood community. We have Tony Walsh who would like to speak to us about Clawson Park. Uh, the same thing, I'd like to lend my support to the name change. Um, I'm the president of the West Quick and Improvement Association. And since 1987, we've worked with Paul um, to 
really go from a neighborhood with no street trees at all mm -hmm. to build any available space. Public. And he drives around looking for a space to put another tree. <laughs> And he's always, and he takes care of them too. He gets out. I've seen him on Christmas Day with no. clippers um, pruning trees. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to work with him all these years to help plant trees. My whole family has planted trees with him, and um, uh, this will be a great recognition of his uh, monumental gift to the city. Really, uh, he's working with urban forestry. He's been on the board there and all that forever. Um, you know, to help advance their agenda. And get and increase the street uh, the tree canopy in the city, and uh, really has an effect on a really wide swath of the of the city, and uh, it was a really important improvement to the to those neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, and and thank you for your volunteer work as well. Uh, Sam Settlemeyer would like to speak to us about another park we have on our agenda, the Walnut Woods of Evanston proposed park. Yes, good morning, my name is Sam Sotomayor. I am with the Civic Garden Center and also a board member for the Walnut Woods of Evanston CPAC. Um, so this is a 10 acre space that's been pretty neglected uh, right next to Walnut Hills High School in Evanston. And for the last couple of years, now volunteers have spent thousands of hours working to establish and maintain a trail system, remove invasive species and Students have been growing uh, native plants and shrubs from seed at the high school to replant into the site. And so we've seen a great deal of community support for this space. And we would like to recognize that through a name change and take this space, which is recognized as Hoyle's Field on a map in Evanston, which represents not only the space, the high school that's right there, but also the Evanston community, which has been involved in that project. Um, so, there's been a lot of widespread community support. We hope that you all would come out and see the site. It's really transformed from a pretty neglected space to a pretty accessible park space. And so we would like for you all to recognize that through that name change. And we hope to see you in the spring. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sam. Um, Brendan Sullivan would like to speak to us about um, the boat dock. Good morning. My Good name morning. Is Brendan Great. How are you guys today? Good. <clears throat> I just want to take a minute. Um, we came in last time to talk about a, a, a second option that is no longer on the table. And we just wanted to make sure that uh, we set an amendment um, on a few things that have, have, uh, uh, we want to address on the scoring of the city doc. There were three things that were of issue with our initial presentation. One of them was inclusion, as you may or may not be aware where we were given zero points on. We just wanted to make sure of the record that um, our contractors are fully registered now with the city, and that was one of the parts that we just wanted to make sure we addressed with you. Secondly, the revenue, because we own Queen City River boats on the other side of the river, that's a, a big connection for us. And the final thing was the location. We just wanted to make sure you were aware it was recommended to us to put it down by Smale Park. We got graded down. On, on that as part of our initial proposal. And we always wanted to put it where the public landing is. We just wanted to make sure that it was of note to the board that that it was our intention to keep it at the uh, uh, city landing. Other than that, we just uh, just wanted to, you know, make sure you were aware of, uh, of, of what we saw as maybe some inappropriate or inaccurate scores on the original scoring from the city that they weren't aware of at the time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we did receive um, the, addendum. the addendum that you sent last evening. And I uh, appreciate you being here in case there's questions when yeah. we take this topic yeah. up. Exactly. And I did have your hard copy last time. So yeah. thank, thank you, you all so much. And we have Ray from uh, to talk to us about Owl's Nest Park. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Rachel. Uh, I'm the Osmond's Park Advisory Council. We represent Evanston, East Walnut Hills, and the O'Brien Business Association. We formed back in 2005 during the original redevelopment of the park that occurred back then. Since then, the community has been steadfast in our desire um, to save and repurpose the pool house at, at the park. So we thank you for putting a pause on the demolition of that structure to give us time to uh, reevaluate the stability. And I wanted to thank um, your staff, Cindy France, Chris McGee, and especially Commissioner Getz for working with us on the recommendations that you're going to um, hopefully approve today. 
and um, which we would urge you to support. A very quick clarification um, in your memo, in your board packet, it says that we have no desire to revisit the programming task of the park as a community. And I think that was a misunderstanding. Um, what we said was, and I think this was reflected in our notes from that November meeting, is that we um, expect and hope that once a once or if a consultant is brought on board to work on the design towards the adapted for use of the structure, that you would, with your staff, engage the community with the consultant to um, work on that design. But it, instead of starting from zero, that you would use the baseline minimum scope that was developed when we were doing the original redevelopment of the park. So it's not that we didn't want to revisit um, the programming, it's that we just didn't want to start from zero. We want to choose that basic minimum scope, which is outlined in your board packet, uh, making sure that the top is open as a pavilion, maybe some minimal bathroom facilities, et cetera. So. Great, thank yeah. you. I, I, I want to know that Ray and uh, Jenny Rosenthal, back when we redeveloped Owls Nest Park and Mrs. Castellini, you'll remember it 10 years ago, I believe, helped in the fundraising to do the full redevelopment. And, I, and I'm very impressed with the community input from all of the, the communities encircling Owls Nest Park and their interest in maintaining this park. So I want to just thank you for what you're doing on a volunteer basis on this. We have Jack. Uh, I'm going to screw this up. Marfin, Martin? Martin? Martin, thank you, Jack. Also to speak to us uh, about potential Gallagher Park. Uh, Maureen, Linda, and Tony have pretty much hit all the high points about Paul, but uh, I met Paul in 1980. I just moved into my house on Ohio Avenue, and it was a house that sat behind all the other houses. We had an Eastman driveway. You couldn't see it from the street. And a fireman walked back. Um, just to check to see if the hoses would reach my house. That environment was Paul Gallagher, he's been a friend ever <laughs> since. Um, I'm, I'm a trustee of the, of the Cuff Neighborhood Association. I retired in 2011 as a city architect of the city. Um, I just want to speak, you know, just, just the dedication that Paul's had for his city and his neighborhood, um, second to none, he deserves a part. <laughs> and Jack, I know you you get a lot of you you spend a lot of time too in your volunteer work at Cuff, and I see you many times. You're involved with CPAC, and I just uh, appreciate your your civic volunteer work that you're doing. Thank you. And finally, uh, Drew Asmus, who would like to speak on the other park on Walnut Woods, Eviston. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I can't match Paul Gallagher as far as uh, his trees and propagation, but uh, I got involved in the Walnut Woods project because my business for 34 years was in Evanston. And I've been on the Evanston Community Council and Executive Board for about 15 years. So I'm, I think I'm, it's fair to say I'm representing Evanston. Uh, the project at Walnut Woods, uh, in my semi-retirement, I started a, a native tree propagation project and Walnut happened to have a greenhouse. So I paired up with Walnut and uh, with the Green Club and the BioEco Club, we, we've grown about 1,500 to 2,000 trees right there mm -hmm. and planted in, in Walnut Woods. So I'm all for the renaming of it. Uh, the Evanston community, it's very important that somehow, some way, the name Evanston was incorporated in that park. You know, Walnut Hills High School is an in that in Walnut Hills. So it was important that uh, somehow we get that name in there and it actually came up at, a, at an Evanston Community Council. Why don't we name it uh, Walnut Woods of Evanston? And it's not perfect, but it, it at least lets people know this is Evanston, this is the park, and as Sam has said, in our partnership with the uh, Civic Garden Center has been invaluable. But uh, you know that that uh, that that park was uh, pretty much a an overgrown wasteland. No one would go down in there, maybe except for illegal activities. Mm -hmm. So. It, it, what it's been transformed into is a wonderful, wonderful piece. And they're actually in, 
incorporating classes now, the bio, the science teacher, Allie Mundini, would be here today, but she uh, she's administering final exams. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will note, uh, just for the record, we also did receive, uh, each of the commissioners received a copy from uh, Freeman Durham, the head of the president of the East Walnut Hills Civic Association, uh, thanking us for our decisions on keeping the pavilion in uh, the Owls Nest Park and looks forward to working with us as we are redeveloping and planning for its revitalization. So we're thankful for that. And then it strikes me today, the input that we have, and we're blessed as a park board to have so many citizens involved civically with our parks. And we very much appreciate it. We also received a, a comment today from Sean and I'll probably say his name wrong, but Sean Hessenstab, who is very active in the Miles Edwards Park on West Price Hill. He was so active in, in that park that he established an advisory committee to focus on advising the park board on things that are needed in that park and has actually gone out and has already started getting a robust group of volunteers to, together to help him as he's been doing invasive species removal and trail maintenance at that park. So again, another example of people really stepping up and loving their parks and helping us to maintain them. He has a special request from us. There's a couple broken picnic benches that he would like to have replaced. So I'm gonna pass this along to uh, Mr. Nyer and let's hope that we can help out that group of volunteers and get them some, some new picnic tables. Okay, so that's all of the public comments. I do want to, before we get into our agenda, officially welcome, officially welcome, <laughs> officially welcome <laughs> <laughs> Mr. John Nyer as our, our director for Cincinnati Parks on an interim basis. John has been it's a very big supporter of parks for many, many years. Grew up in Cincinnati and hung out at the parks in, in Cincinnati and for 12 years worked with the, the Cincinnati Parks Foundation Board, even serving as their president for a time. He's been very loyal member of uh, our finance committee that we have as part of this board and has volunteered his, his time to that very noble cause. So we just wanna welcome you John, we appreciate your willingness to step in and help us out. We're really looking forward to what you can help us with here at the park board. So thank you. And thank you. I'm glad to be here and really enjoying getting to uh, work. It's a, it's a sip of a fire hose, but we have a, a great team uh, on the other end of that hose. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you, John. Okay, with that, we'll move into our agenda today. The first thing on our agenda is approval of minutes from back in October, October 21. I hope that everybody's had an opportunity to review the minutes. Are there any changes, corrections, additions to those minutes? If not, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. We have a motion and second to approve October's 21 minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed to nay. Thank you, we've got those approved. We do have some additional minutes that we will, we will approve at our next meeting. And I apologize for not having those to us today. The next agenda item we have is dealing with the name of uh, name chains for the parks. And Rocky, I think, and John, uh, do you want to introduce this or do you want to? I will defer to Rocky, Rocky? Uh, on the heavy lifting. Thank you. Welcome, Rocky. Good morning. I've actually done no heavy lifting. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the folks here have. So, um, yeah, I, I, I want to thank you all for being here today and talk about the renaming. So, there are some I've only communicated via email or phone, so good to put a name to the face as well. Um, and I think they've sort of made this job today pretty easy by explaining to you uh, both of these projects. But uh, there's a few pieces I'll uh, quickly fill in for you. At the last meeting, uh, Commissioner Getz, we got a, a communication about the Gallagher Park, and uh, you asked staff to uh, report back on what our policy is when it comes to naming, as well as to look into this matter. And so you've got the, the board report that does that. In addition, uh, we, we just by chance received a similar request 
one and put Evanston so we can bind them both together for you. Um, uh, so when it comes to uh, the, re the renaming policy, there are criteria there that are laid out in your report. Um, there's no doubt uh, in terms of what staff has done that we believe both of these requests meet the criteria. <clears throat> Uh, when it comes to Gallagher Park, as they said, Mr. Gallagher has for years, he, he was retired since St. Firefighter, served on numerous community boards. Um, I, I couldn't hear exactly in the hallway, but I think this is an interesting anecdote. He, for years, drove around a red truck that he had specially outfitted with a large water tank. And he would go around, uh, not just in the cup area, but all over Cincinnati to uh, water and take care of these, of these trees. Um, so his contribution over 50 years uh, is truly unmatched. And as you heard today, um, you know, he's beloved in the community. And uh, we, we appreciate that and, and want to honor that. One of the criteria, oh, and Mary, I didn't know if you had the locations. We had some difficulties with the with, screen okay, today. So. I was going to have her show you the locations just to orient you to where the spaces were. Um, the person being recognized for the naming should have made a major and significant contribution to Cincinnati Parks for the Cincinnati community or be a person, person of national or international importance. Um, I think clearly uh, Mr. Gallagher would be put into that category. I won't list all of the um, other yeah. boards and associations that he was part of, um, but I did want to mention that <laughs> um, our archives and we did find records to show that there really was no particular significance to the name Clawson Park. It was named after the street that kind of dead ends into it. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there were sort of no issues there. And also, um, as you can see from the folks here today, uh, the community, including the community council um, in the area supports this as well. So we are not aware of any particular opposition. When it comes to uh, Walnut Woods at Evanston, this is a wonderful, wonderful example of a community collaboration that's been highly successful. Um, really led by the community, and when I say the community, we're talking about Walnut Hills, Walnut Hills High School students um, and teachers and parents. We're talking about the Evanston Community Council, and we're talking about the Civic Garden Center. Um, they've come together over the last six years and taken what was just essentially a wild space that was overfilled with invasives like unfortunately we have throughout our system and took it upon themselves to, to clean this up, improve it, provide access via trails, um, and really turned it into an accessible park that can be enjoyed by the community and can also be used uh, in, in learning. Is a natural environment for the students at Walnut Hills. Um, they went through a lot of the highlights, uh, but I would mention um, that they, uh, they've put in a total of 5,600 volunteer hours, valued at $161,000. They've also secured $40,000 in grants as part of their project. So when I say a wonderful partnership, We've been supportive of our staff, our volunteer crew, Crystal's here today. Uh, and Lou is part of this when I got started. I see Lou here today. We've, we've worked with them to give them what they need, create events, and make this happen. But, but they've really done a lot of the heavy lifting. And I do want to mention the grants that we received Keep Cincinnati Beautiful, Walnut Woods Parent Association, the Duke Energy Foundation, the Garden Club of Cincinnati, GE, the Oliver Family Trust. A foundation, Taft Family Foundation, and about almost fourteen thousand dollars worth of individual donations. So they're also putting their money where their mouth is and taking it upon themselves to, when they have a need, uh, meet that need rather than coming to us. So all that is to say, we certainly, staff certainly, uh, would recommend renaming both of these parks. And um, if if that's the decision that the board intends to take, we plan to work with the folks here today on uh, properly. Uh, coming up with signage at the park to properly indicate the names. Thank you. Any questions for Rocky or comments about these two agenda items? Uh, I'll just echo your comment. I mean, this is a great example of giving back and, and contributing to the 
betterment of the of the community and uh, really to be commended. Well presented, thanks. Yes. I, I think both, I think um, Paul is still on our urban forestry advisory group, if I'm not mistaken. So he continues to serve even at the age of 94. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. And, and the program at, at Walnut Hills, I remember when I first came on the board, there was a presentation. I really think that that is a model of how we can work with parks and our schools. And I know there's a group working together today, looking for more opportunities for outdoor green classrooms uh, where the parks are working with CPS and trying to find actual programs where we can programmatic get kids into parks. And I think that is a great, great example of how that can be very, very successful. So thank you, Sam, for uh, the work with the Civic Garden Center, as well as with the other groups that have made that a, a success. With that, do I um, have a motion regarding, and I'd like to do them one at a time. Do we, I have a motion on the renaming of Clawson Park to Gallagher Park? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any other discussion? Roll call, all those, no, we'll do it by voice. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, thank you. And then we also have renaming uh, for, and I want to get the wording right here. I, I want to make sure, because it's important, the name of this park. Do we have Walnut. a Walnut, the Hoys Field today would be renamed Walnut Woods of Evanston. Do I have a motion to do that? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second, thank you, Mr. Lindner. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Great. Uh, John, I would like to ask you to write on behalf of the park board to, to Mr. Gallagher, uh, expressing our gratitude and telling him that we passed that resolution today. And also if we can contact uh, Walnut Hills as well. Absolutely. And we'll be going out with a press release, hopefully today, if not today, tomorrow on this. And I would encourage staff to work with the community and we definitely want new signs and let us know when we can do an unveiling, uh, a special event commemorating the new names of the park. Thank you, Rocky. Absolutely. Thank you all. Okay, the next item we have is the Sawyer Point Pickleball concept and who's going to present that? Jenny Mobley, thank you. So as you know, uh, in the, at the June board meeting, the concept of pickleball was approved to move forward with staff. And since then, we have been doing meetings every three weeks to work with planning, finance, as well as Gary Lessis, who has uh, been a very enthusiast advocate for pickleball and um, gathering those groups to do so. Uh, so I wanted to uh, bring Gary up to explain to you, since we are having technical difficulties, technical difficulties, excuse me. There is a presentation um, printed out in your packet. Gary is going to briefly remind you what the concept of pickleball at Sawyer Point is, and then I will pick up with the budget and our request. Thank you. Morning, Gary. Good morning, gentlemen. Lynn ladies, thank you uh, for allowing me to present again. And I want to thank you for your service here. I've watched a number of the meetings on YouTube, and uh, today we get to talk about something that's a lot of fun. Fun, <laughs> okay. Um, the first slide is to bring you up to speed. Um, if you remember, six months ago when we met, we talked about the growth of pickleball and how it's just incredible growth. Well, we just got the numbers for 2020, and the growth from 2019 to 2020 is 21% nationwide. Um, over the last six years, we have 71% more players than we did six years ago. So nationally, it's been phenomenal. But if we look at Sawyer Point, the next slide, that growth has been absolutely spectacular. It's hard to see on your black and white. Oh, we got color. color. <laughs> okay. The line that looks like a heart monitor is the daily attendance at each of the group play sessions. We have 12 of those group play sessions a week. The red line shows the average over time and the black line that moves up and down a bit, but flat, that shows the court capacity. 
So if we look at just uh, this year, we had 15,834 players attend 308 group play sessions, averaging 51.4 players per session. If you look at that compared to last year, we had an average growth, we had the growth on average participation of 65%. So 31.1 average number of players per session in 2019, up to 51.4, or uh, I, think, I think I said 2020 to 2021, 31.1 to 51.4. Our Facebook membership grew 157% from 676 to 1740. And our messaging platform grew 72% from 240 to 413. And what's interesting is that I was chatting with Mr. Nyer about this last week. Just 29 months ago, I had my first meeting with Jenny and Lou uh, at the courts. And the idea was, let's get a few courts down here and have a little bit of fun on these courts that aren't being used at all. So it started from, well, let's just have four courts and play a little pickleball to all of a sudden blossoming into this uh, world-class opportunity that we have today. Next slide, uh, just wanted to show you our participation. This was, this photo was taken at our social on 829. And there were about 175 people there that day. So next slide, we're, we're gonna create a world-class facility. We'll have the best courts and the best lights in the Midwest. This will be a destination point for people to come. It's not just a, a simple paint and patch job. This is going to be a 12 layer cushion surface that people are going to travel to across the Midwest to play on because it will be uh, less painful for their joints to play on. Um, the same comparable type of courts as the Linder Family Tennis Center in Mason. So this is first class. We will have 12 dedicated pickleball courts and keep four tennis courts in place with eight overflow pickleball courts layered on top of those four uh, tennis courts for tournaments and overflow purposes. We're renovating the office, the bathrooms, and looking at potentially uh, putting a stadium shade over those, the um, seated stadium seats. So this facility will then be able to host clinics, camps, tournaments, yielding economic impact for the city of Cincinnati and the general Cincinnati area and Cincinnati businesses. Um, we're gonna skip over the next slide. Oh, are we in the right one? Okay. All right, we we're gonna skip over your right. slide and go to the following. One of the things that we've noticed is those courts down there were resurfaced 10, 12, maybe 13 years ago, and they were just left to waste. We're not going to allow that to happen. I'm very confident that had those courts been properly maintained over the years, we would have gotten another five or 10 years out of that. So to avoid that, um, we're not gonna let that happen. Working with the Cincinnati Parks Foundation, we created an endowment specifically for the maintenance and repair of those courts in the future. We start, kicked that out nine days ago and as of this morning, we have 33 donors who have either donated or pledged $59,000 into this endowment. We're gonna raise the $500,000 one way or the other so that we'll be able to protect these courts at infinitum. Um, we will do that, uh, evidenced by our two fundraisers, one that we had last year and one this year, we raised $35,000 from 64 donors that paid for additional nets and upgraded sound system and a pickleball um, practice machine. So, yeah. Thank you. Jenny, I just want to ask this gentleman Absolutely. to give the history of pickleball yes. <laughs> because it is kind of interesting how it all came to be. Yes. Can, can yeah, a little bit. It was formed in 1965. There are two thoughts as to the naming of pickleball. One was that they had a dog named pickle. It, this was done in the Northwest. Um, it was a, Seattle. A, a man developed it for his children. For his ch children, right. right. Uh, to entertain the children. And then there are two questions. What, one, one thought is that they had a dog named Pickles. And the other is that his wife was a rower. And um, I guess in rowing, you're in the pickle boat, in the back of the boat that um, in the team rowing competition. 
So those are the two names on that. But it was formed in 1965. And the other thing I think is is kind of interesting is why did he create that scoring? It is yeah. so complicated. <laughs> well, it, it's really complicated. Uh, the, the game of pickleball is super easy to learn. I mean, the scoring is a little complicated at first, but it really takes a lifetime to master. It's, <laughs> It's fun. The it's game or the score? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the score you can get after the first day. Okay, all right. Didn't know how complicated it was. I just, I just thank you for that. How many have played it? <clears throat> I've seen it on TV. They even have it on TV now. Yeah, you know you've made it to the big time when all of a sudden now there's a contract with ESPN. Okay. And if you notice a few weeks ago, it was on ESPN Plus. And, and we're not quite ESPN prime time yet, but it's getting there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. So uh, in front of us today, I know you have already approved the concept and we have been working uh, alongside. Um, however, the city administration budget office has placed $250,000 targeted for the Sawyer Point Pickleball courts in our fiscal year 22 budget currently. They have also agreed that they are placing an, an additional $250,000 in the fiscal year 23 budget um, as a target. However, in order to move forward and try to make sure that we can um, get our multiple award contracts um, and our fees ready to go, we need to make sure we have the full uh, $500,000 in our funds to go ahead and certify money, which we would bring those contracts to you once they are ready to go. But we are looking today, as you see, the estimated budget here right now is at $448,000. That includes resurfacing of the courts, lights, the installation of the lights. We've uh, talked about in, uh, installing timers so that not all the courts have to be on at the same time, only the courts that are being played on the uh, guests can actually turn on those lights themselves. Renovations of the tennis building, like we talked about additional nets, um, proper nets uh, for each court, blowers and a possible shade solution, which does not have a dollar amount to it at this moment. So, I'm sorry, did you have a question? I yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you you're done. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought you were gonna ask a question. So um, in order to move forward at this time, we are asking to reallocate funds from our current fiscal year 22 budget, 980, the Infrastructure and Rehabilitation Fund, in order to add to the 250 that we have to make a total of $500,000 in order to uh, move forward with the RFP and or multiple award contracts. My first question to you is, yes. Are we, do, are we going for an RFP or are we going for an RFI to begin with? Because if we don't have an RFI going forward, we're never gonna be able to see the contracts that come in. Capiche? And so I'm questioning whether, how we're going about this. So we were moving forward with a multiple award contract and I believe Cindy is on the line. She can probably explain it better Cindy's when it comes to- right there. I'm sorry, Cindy. <laughs> Multiple, multiple would you speak award. up, please? Yeah, we would probably move forward with the multiple award contract, which is what Jenny just said. So it would be um, the work would go out to about six different contractors that already have um, contracts with the city. Um, so there would be a, there would be a big process with it. It is not an RFP though. And and the timing for that, what is what does if we went out with the multiple award contract? Anarchy, 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 anarchy. Yeah. Um, uh, it would be a couple of months before we got proposals back, probably about two months. And then if we had an acceptable bid, by the time we were, we have an executed work order and funds certified, we could probably look at uh, May as a start date, which is fine because I think the first piece of the work that we would be looking at doing is to surfacing those courts and it's it's uh, the installation is based on uh, temperature so we were already looking at doing the work starting in April or May. Mm -hmm. Question I just want to confirm will these also be straight for tennis and will this include tennis uh, next as well? 
Yes, it will. Uh, so right now there are eight courts down um, at Sawyer Point. We would take the first four courts and transform them into six, actually 12, excuse me, football courts, six on each side. And then the uh, remaining four would also uh, transform back into tennis courts with new nets, obviously new surface. This is to resurface the entire and restrike the entire um, area. We would have then temporary nets uh, for to use those four tennis courts as pickleball courts as needed in tournaments, name it. So you would have four tennis courts, 12 pickleball all the time, and then a possibility of. Do you have any um, any information on what the level of tennis activity is there? No. It is um, not very well. Um, we really do not have uh, too many tennis players that, that come there on a regular basis. I do not have attendance for you. Um, but through the years, uh, there used to be uh, high schools that actually used those mm -hmm. courts as their home courts. They since then have uh, found different home courts. So um, the attendance there has really decreased as far as tennis use. All that noise from the pickleball. That's <laughs> right, they're, they're moving them out. Now, is it also probable that the, the state of the courts uh, deferred or uh, deterred people from coming to play there? It is possible they were renovated. I believe it was in 2010, if my memory serves me correctly. And, um, but even at that point, we have had different tennis pros that have worked out of the tennis building, trying to really increase attendance. And um, all my time that I've been involved at Sawyer Point, um, I probably a handful of times have seen that all the courts have been used for tennis, even on high school tournament days. Um, but they did, they used to run programs out of there and uh, certainly personal lessons. And at most, I would say two to three courts were the ones that were being utilized. Lou, did you have? Yeah, yeah I would like to add just a few uh, comments in terms of the effects with tennis. Uh, we took an incremental approach. We just started with a few courts and then we expanded that to kind of test the waters on this. So, uh, you know, again, we feel, you know, that we've thought through this quite a bit and we do not really anticipate that, but we have preserved, again, what we feel is an appropriate level of. You know, a, a tennis option there. Yeah. Uh, I just on the financing, I, I thought that I had seen emails or something where the city was going to bring forward money into 2022 for the second $250,000. Am I hearing correctly that, that there was not 250 that the city found to, to move into 2022? As far as my understanding, they have placed it on a target for fiscal year 23. However, uh, it is not necessarily in our budget or will come to our budget in 22, unless I am mistaken. But. Yes, uh, commissioners, what the city has proposed is we utilize our infrastructure rehabilitation dollars in fiscal 22, and they increase our target amount in fiscal 23 by $250,000. So that would mean we would need to push a project from fiscal 22 onto fiscal 2020 infrastructure rehabilitation. And, and we have that documented, is my question, yes. because I know that's to be yes, awarded in 2023. Okay, great. Uh, for clarification, we're in fiscal 22, right? We're in 22. Mm -hmm. okay. So what, what we're hearing here is that the city has asked us to take money that we had allocated in 2022 for other projects and apply it to the 250 that they actually gave us for this project with the understanding that they will try and get 250,000 approved by city council in June to replace the 250 that's coming out of our, our budget. That's why I just wanna make sure we've got paper trail. Yes, uh, I only had one other question. Uh, I, I read an article about an $8 million pickleball complex coming to Norwood. How does that impact your draw or how would you say that that might impact this project? 
keeps on growing. It, uh, we're going to have there's there's going to be five indoor courts, five outdoor courts, and one indoor outdoor court, and a bar at the U.S. Playing Card Factory in Norwood. It's going to be fantastic. It'll be opening end of next year. Perfect. Any other questions? So we have before us. Go ahead. Uh, just on the financing. So. We have a paper trail, but we're still exposed for the 250. If if the council says uh, we're going to change our mind, but that's correct. Okay, and it's only 250. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would yeah, be that would be what our yeah, exposure is. would be if the city backed out yeah. from uh, their commitment. So we have a recommendation that we allocate and the action we have to take today is as we were just saying, we have to reallocate $250,000 from our fund 980 to apply to this fund, this project so that we can go out for contract uh, with the understanding that we will seek replacement of that 250. Do I have a motion as to this recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? My is, I just have one question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi. If indeed the city doesn't give us money, what are we not able to do because we're doing this? Craig, what, where is the 250 that we are pulling for this project? What was it earmarked it? for? Uh, yes, Cindy can answer that, but I also want to indicate that if that does occur, there is opportunity that we can look at fund 318 or fund 752. It's still restricted so yeah. park board money. Yeah, okay. But the, Cindy? Yeah, for the, the $250,000 that we're essentially fronting out of our old money, uh, there's a number of projects that we have that uh, we're not going to need the funds for the next eight months or so until the fiscal year 23 money comes. The $300,000 that we have right now set aside for Owl's Nest Pavilion. If we, we probably should have done my report first, but that piece of, that, that the funding that we have for that, we could easily defer to until we get that fiscal year 23 funding. I'm a little concerned about that. I, I don't like the concept of a project that we want to move forward with and stabilizing that Owl's Nest building that we just arbitrarily take that earmarked money and move it over to Pickleball. I mean, that's a decision I think this board should make. Well, can if you know, Robin, Peter, if it's, Paul. the timeline that we have, to do anything with Apple's Nest, we need to, or what we are going to be recommending is to use some of that money to engage with a consultant. So that would be a portion of that $300,000, but there would easily be another 250 that we would not be able to utilize until fiscal year 23 money comes in. So I'm not suggesting that we stop anything with Apple's Nest moving forward, we just don't need the whole $300,000 right away. So, if I correct you, your, your concern is if council does not um, choose to sort of replenish that 250 that's being brought forward, then do we have a project we're committed to that funding has been redirected because it's going forward? Is that a correct? Yes, but here? more more pointedly, is the Peter concept, Paul. yeah, the concept of pushing. I don't want to delay opportunities, and that's where I'm not sure how much we will be approving today for the contract for Owl's Nest. But in concept, I don't like that that approach that we are taking money from a project that is a very high profile project that we are committed to doing. I feel. Uh, to just assume that we'll take that money and put it over into a pickleball, pickleball court. Uh, is there no other funding $250,000 available that we can use to front this money for, commissioners. for the, for the right. pickleball? Exactly. Certainly. I mean, the, we have a lot of, uh, 
the fiscal year 22 capital infrastructure money, none of that has been spent as of yet. A lot of these projects just take time to kind of move through the system and anything that would require any kind of engineering services, we could probably go ahead and, and utilize that funding. Is So I guess the question is, in the fiscal year 2022 capital authorization that we have, the two plus million dollars, is there 250,000 of un, un encumbered or un yes. <laughs> identified uses for? Certainly. Okay. Yes, in the, in the capital infrastructure budgets, we um, have money set aside for emergencies or for just unknowns. And certainly there's $250,000 Okay. For that purpose, that we could utilize as well. Okay. If I may, Al's Nest was an example potential, but I don't think this is. Well, if there's a problem with council with that 250, then Al's Nest is off the table. That that is one of multiple streams of revenue that could cover that if that happens. We're comfortable that won't happen based on commitments and conversations and research with city managers' office, et cetera. But if you like officials go differently, uh, there are other funds that are available to move that forward. There are also in addition to expedience, there is also some programmatic advantage to funding the pickleball because of the sequencing part. So you don't want to put down a new servicing and then drive equipment on top of it. So having that <laughs> sequencing in in play is an advantage uh, to that as yeah. well. But I, I, I think the uh, the owl's nest was an example, not a definitive. Oh, we would absolutely do that. So I think there are a variety of spots that funds could be pulled from to advance that. But the question was different. I heard the question different. Now, how can we move the money around to make sure we have the money available? The question in my head was, is there something we will not be able to do in the event council does not approve this $250,000 and we have moved this money forward? Is there something we're not able to do because we've spent $250,000 on pickleball? If I am, please correct me if I am, but I, my understanding is that there is not a defined project that will not be able to move forward uh, okay. if that does not come forward. Is that uh, if there's not a defined specific project that won't advance if that happens okay. that way? That's answers my question. <clears throat> well, and, and that's where it's, it's more the concept here that we are looking, this board's looking for transparency, and it, particularly as it relates to projects. And that's where I don't want to start the process of reallocating funds without us being aware of what we are doing and agree that that is an appropriate <coughs> reallocation, even if it's a timing difference. Mm -hmm. To me, it, it's a concern that I, I, I just want to make sure we place. So that if, in my opinion, if I were making this motion, I would make the motion that we, we uh, allocate two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of unallocated monies available um, to front this project, and I guess that was just a motion. We didn't I make a motion, did we? Okay. Did we have a motion on the table? We did have a motion. We did have a motion. Okay, okay. but it was different than. Yeah. Can we avenge your? Can we a friendly admission? Uh, no, uh, not with mine. <laughs> Okay, so we have an amended motion on the floor that we approve staff's recommendation to allocate 250,000, additional 250,000 towards a pickleball from unearmarked, unallocated 200 uh, funds in our capital budget. So moved. No, that's that's no? that's already okay. done. Moved second. second. All right. Whatever you want. Any further discussion on this? <laughs> Get us out of a pickle here, right? Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for your energy. And uh, it's exciting. You know, I'm I'm glad Very we're putting exciting. that that park to use and doing something that uh, will bring people into the park. So thank you, Gary. Exactly. Okay, so next we will continue talking about Owl's Nest. So who is going to lead us through that? Cindy? So this summer we were looking to demo the building. This is one of our approved projects. 
We hit the pause button on that. All the demo equipment has been removed. We had some community engagement. And what we are recommending now is that we bring a consultant in to give us almost a menu of some different options based on some programming that the community has already done. We feel that the $300,000 that we have earmarked for this project right now is enough to pay for um, some consulting work and also to cover the cost to stabilize the structure and possibly to rebuild some retaining walls on either side of the building that had been removed previously. So what we're looking, the, what, we're, what we're asking is to go ahead and engage with a consultant to give us uh, we're, we're kind of looking at this as a three as a three um, tier project. The first one would just be to stabilize the structure and to do the retaining walls. Um, the, the second piece of it would be to open up the pavilion on the upper level, and the third would be to add restrooms in the bottom and possibly some storage. So we're comfortable that we have funding at least to take care of that first piece. The other two pieces, we're not sure where the funding would come from. So that's something definitely to consider. The consultant that we would be engaging, we will put, it would be an RFP that we put out for design services. It's, it can be called a mini RFP. And we would structure the mini RFP so that we are only getting schematic design up front. And that is what we are going to be paying for. It's similar to what we did for the Reading Road facility um, for Police District 5. And once we were comfortable with the cost estimate and the schematic design we have, and after we've done community engagement, and our intention was to involve the community through this entire process. So I apologize if that wasn't clear in the board before. <laughs> um, but yes, that was definitely our intention. Um, once we had a better idea of where the funding, the rest of the project was going, was coming from, then we could go ahead and move forward with full blown CDs and decide whether we were going to <coughs> billion or or the entire project. So the recommended, what we're recommending is, is that we take the three hundred thousand dollars and reappropriate reappropriate it to um, uh, stabilizing the building, and we are asking for permission to. Um, Submit an RFP to put an RFP out for design services. And I think there is a draft of our. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions, questions? Question. I think I, uh, first of all, I'm fully in support of breathing new life into this facility, as well as all the other shuttered facilities in many of our parks. Um, we didn't get have a lot of attention on this particular facility until we had demo equipment at private. And I'm glad that we ceased that and we're coming up with a plan. But two things. One, I just want to make not miss the opportunity to stress the importance of developing priorities as a board. Uh, because again, this is another instance of us acting in a very reaction, right reactionary fashion. And again, we have many shuttered facilities and our parks. So I I question, you know, why this one versus one in Inwood Park or one in Burnett Woods or you know, they're all over the place. Um, so that's one question I think for our board to address. And number two, what what's what are the preliminary visions um, for this facility by the community and maybe where they can give us some thoughts on where this is headed. Uh, well, what we heard from the community, and just correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they are anxious for the upper level to be opened up as a pavilion for picnic tables and to open up use to the back of the park. And kind of more long term would be to put bathrooms in the lower level with, with storage um, spaces for equipment. That, that was kind of weird. I think this very briefly, um, quick history. We um, when we started back in 2005 for the original redevelopment of the 10 acre park, the pool house was going to be phase two. Um, we ran out of money. Uh, we did phase one. The neighborhood, it was a $2 million project. The neighborhood was asked to come up with half, um, which we did with passion and time. We came very close to that. 
target and the city put in a million dollars. We didn't have enough money to then do the pool house and that project took five or six years. So it was a um, very huge effort on the part of the city and on part of the neighborhood. And we did do, in 2010, we did, um, so we worked with, um, we worked with KZF and they came up with a plan for the, for the uh, pool house. And we did community engagement um, uh, with schools, with the neighbor, with all of the community councils, with um, churches, everybody involved. And what we were looking at is, is a pool structure with no pool, the building is up, so we can't use it. So the top floor, we would like to see it open up, keep the, icon the iconic structure, the roof line, the archways, the brick facade, um, and leave the top as a shelter, as Cindy described, for not just picnicking or organic activities that might crop up, but, but planned events. Um, and also create access around the building, um, because now it, it, it's not very accessible for folks. That, that would have 360 degree access and the, the south face of the building that faces Evanston right now looks like the back end of the building. So we would like both sides of the building to have some interest, some design interest so that there is no front door and back door on the building. Um, there are shower facilities, restroom facilities on the top and the bottom. Um, and what we're asking is, if possible, I know this is, <clears throat> something that is not often done, but just to have some minimal restroom facilities, <clears throat> excuse me, possibly on the bottom level <clears throat> to um, just to be opened up during events um, and and also make uh, as some sort of space, some lighting, and, and as I said, just some interest on both sides of the building. And that's sort of our basic minimum scope that is described here, and that, that's what we worked on back in 2010. And, um, and, I, and that is what the neighborhood sort of agrees as sort of a baseline that we would like to see with the structure. Are there no restroom facilities in this park now? No. no. So when we have events, I will say since the redevelopment, <clears throat> before the redevelopment, I don't know if you're familiar with the park, it, it lies directly between Evanston and East Wanna Hills and the Bryanville and Hyde Park. So it really sits in between mm -hmm. all of these neighborhoods and it acted as a barrier between all the neighborhoods because the whole five acre south portion of the park is a giant flooded pit, um, like from Parks and Rec. So <laughs> we actually got dirt from the Xavier development and they um, brought all of the dirt over, filled that in. Um, there were 24 steps going down into that pit. It used to be a ball field. The Reds Community Fund um, helped us do the ball field back there. We redid the basketball courts, um, trails, lighting. And now it really has brought the neighborhood together. And Evanston, East Wall, and Hope and Bryanville work very closely together to, to make that happen. So um, we, in the beginning, we had all of these events. We had the, we, there used to be the, um, the park board community, community picnics that the parks would put on. We hosted those at Alice's Park. We had concerts, Shakespeare, um, all of these different events. And then people just sort of started coming organically and doing their thing. And it's been wonderful. I know if you drive by Madison Road in the summertime, the grills and picnic areas are always being used. The ball field is the home turf for the Walnut Hills Eagles girls softball team. Um, Little League plays there. It's been wonderful. So I think... Um, <coughs> I'm just going to interrupt you because yes, I go to that park a lot with my grandchildren <laughs> and, uh, and witness the ball games a lot. And oh my, there really needs to be a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my point is, when, you know, when we do have a large event, my district too now does all of their um, uh, night, night out. Night out. The night out yeah. yeah. events, which I mean, we get hundreds and hundreds of people. I mean, have to. The East Walnut Hills Assembly always donates the money for the portageons. Right. You know, it's yeah. terrible. Not, yes, Lou. Not, we, uh, if I could may interject, I think we've already engaged with East Walnut Hills and uh, Edmondson Community Councils at some level. When we've got a preliminary plan of a pretty robust, uh, um, you know, programming schedule already. 
the uh, CSO uh, Cincinnati sub, Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra wants to do a full mm -hmm. orchestra performance there uh, on the 6th of August. You mentioned National Night Out, and um, I think we're going to do uh, another two community concerts. Uh, That's great. On awesome. On great. great. So we're leaning forward. So great. We've been, but boy, it would be nice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll just add great thanks to you and other members in the community for advocating for this park and for the building. I think it's great to have converted the park from what we call a barrier to what's really a bridge between a couple of very different communities, and that's important in our city. So, uh, and, just, you know, to speak to why this park, just from my perspective, the community's perspective, as, as I said, we've been working on this for 15 years, and while from 2010 to, to now, there was a, a lull in, in activism and engagement, we, we never stopped asking, um, engaging the staff here, um, and even park board members, city council members, on doing something about the pool house and getting, the, and getting that going. We just sort of hit roadblocks um, in doing that. We, we thought we could um, possibly use TIF money from the Benston and East Warren Hills have TIF funds. This park is not in either of those TIF districts, but we've gotten some guidance from folks down at the city that that it may be possible as a public benefit to bring that in. We approached the neighborhoods about that. It didn't go over very well. And so it's not as if that demo equipment appeared and we all of a sudden panicked. We, we've really been trying since 2005 to do something about the pool house, but we got the impression from the park board at the time and the staff at the time that it just wasn't ever going to happen, um, despite um, our constant nagging yeah. uh, and and making true efforts. Like we had raised a lot of money before, we were willing to do it again. We just got no. We we didn't get the. Um, got it. The cooperation that we're getting at. So. Well, uh, we and we appreciate that. <laughs> Couple of comments. I think you have a very valid point, Molly, as far as prioritizing and why this park versus another one. And I think this is a case where we we were the ones that brought it on by by planning to demolish it and bringing the equipment on site. So I think because we did that, it triggered this is now a priority. And I and I know having been involved uh, on the periphery. There's been so much time and uh, free work that's been done by the community. We've had professional organizations come in for free, do walk through assessment of the facility, some engineering work has been done. So it's, it's at a point, what Cindy's bringing today, it's at a point where we can't just continue going down the road expecting volunteer services along the way to help us plan what we're going to do at that park and the plan would be to bring in a designer because as we're doing this as cindy said in phases we want to make sure that what we do in phase one doesn't have to be redone for ultimately what's done in phase two or phase three so i think the timing is such that's why cindy's bringing it to us today is that we've gone a long way with some free work done by professionals in the community and now the community saying okay we want to know this is going forward and let's have something here that we can use then to promote this, this program. And to your point, we do have a lot of buildings throughout the park system that are shuttered. Normally that is because we don't have a program for that particular facility. And session stands that we have to close. Inwood Pavilion, that also used to be a pool house. And it's been, it's been closed for a number of years. I think that was a building we actually inherited from CRC when they when they got rid of that. That's, so that's I, kind of why we why we have those facilities. And it's a very valid point. I think that is something that we want to continue to focus on with the uh, infrastructure study that we just had done, prioritizing. And I know that we want to be involved with making a decision up front what to do with each of those buildings and uh, intentionally having a plan for each one. Mr. President, yes, I, I really look forward to our doing that because I, I don't know this park all that well, but I've read as much as I could about it. And I'm still confused. 
I really don't understand how we got here. The when I saw when I was reading the documents and I see that at some point there was a five hundred and forty thousand dollar estimate for renovating that building. And then we can we just said we said we're gonna spend three hundred thousand dollars to tear it down. But, so there's just a lot that I don't understand. Right. The good thing about it is, I think, is that we're at the point that we are today, that we can take it, slow it down, take another look at it, and do what is right and have a good outcome here. The thing that I still don't understand is, as I read the recommendation, the recommendation is to have a design firm do the design for the renovation and the ultimate design. It, it looked like it was two, I think you described three steps, but what I wasn't understanding is what, what is the first thing we need to do? Is that getting the approval to do the whole thing or is it stabilizing or how, how do you think about, help me understand yes. how to think about the process of moving forward. The first thing we need to do is send out an RFP for design services. And the, the proposal is going to be uh, written in a way that we can break out all the separate phases for their services. So step one is schematic design, which will just give a kind of a high level um, look at the entire facility and the different phases that I was kind of talking about, with the different, different uh, levels of finish that we want for the facility. And it'll give us an idea of what each one of those pieces is going to cost. Uh, from that, we can kind of decide, we can decide how far where if, if we have funding that we would want to do just the stabilization or the stabilization and completing the upper level, um, just how far we kind of want to take it. And then once we make that decision, then we can move forward with the consultant to develop drawings further so that we can put it out to bid and finally get it constructed. Does that make you, you look like you're still confused? Yeah, I'm, 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 I know. I'm still confused. Yeah, something that uh, helped me think about this is that when we were talking to the um, construction guys that uh, Mr. Betts referred to, if you do move forward with, um, say, stabilizing the entire building without thinking about the programming, yes. the future of it, that like works. you may be spending money. Uh, you know, those interior walls that we would like to take out on that top floor, there's an old office and bathroom, they're, they're um, load bearing. Load bear. yes. So yes. if then you use the stabilization money to shore up all of, the, all of the masonry and all of that work, and then later we decide we're going to knock those down, um, that doesn't make any sense. So sure. if you're doing this sort of stepwise, we do stabilization and this baseline minimum scope design of uh, the programming that the community has asked for, it kind of makes better sense in terms of which walls are we really needing to shore up here and which ones can we leave alone because we're going to knock them down. I get, I get all of that. Okay. I appreciate you helping me. I get all of that. And I, I think where I'm, I'm going or missing is, is there an opportunity to vision what you would want this to be. What do we want, where do we want it to be? So when- Let me, let me finish my thought before I lose it. <laughs> um, is it, can we envision what we want it to be and back up from there and say, stabilizing and then building towards that vision. Is that more than we can do right now? Because we don't know if, this is a bearing wall and we take that out and it, all that stuff you just said. You know, um, but I'm I'm just trying to think about it is can we think about it longer term? Yes. So that we're I understand even if you have a long-term vision, you're gonna do it in steps. Mm -hmm. But it, I'm thinking it is sounding to me like we're gonna do a step based on the vision we have right this minute instead of thinking about it more long term. My, my reaction is that I think the step that we're taking today is more long term vision because okay. if, if we weren't, 
we would just take the 300,000, go in and do what needed to be done to be able to ensure that the walls aren't gonna further deteriorate and that we don't run the risk of the, the building being in worse condition in yes. five or 10 years. Yes, yes. So rather than, rather than just going in today, that's why I think the proposal is to get this design work done. There, there, and I, and I apologize because I've, I've sat in some of these meetings, so I know mm -hmm. there, there was a, a lot of visioning that was done <laughs> back when the, when the entire park. park was renovated. There was a big vision, and I think as Ray alluded to, there was phase one, yeah. phase two. And there was a lot of visioning that phase two was gonna be take this building and open it up and make it so that both sides, because right now they're two very different, mm -hmm. it would look like there's a front, and today it's a front and back, that it would look like an open, and then down below would be putting back, instead of having bathrooms plus shower rooms that are in there, that maybe you put some bathrooms back and then use that excess space for storage or something like that. There's been a lot of, of visioning that was done before. I think there's a realistic aspect that comes into play here where the group said, there's not a whole lot more you can do with this building. Yes. So rather than uh, doing all new visioning, start where they were and say, okay, does this still, is this still what we have in mind? And it sort of fits into what had been designed with the front and the back anyway. So to, in my thinking, I think this is a good step to say before we move one bulldozer load of dirt, that we sort of have this high vision of where we ultimately want to be. Got it. That I is mean, is, isn't that what the consultant and the community engagement is going to lead us to? Yeah. yeah so, is that okay. ultimate? That's, that's phase one. That's what we're, you know. That's kind of, right. So if you approve what's in front of me today, in six months or so, I will come back to you and I will say it's going to cost, I'm going to make up some numbers here, $300,000 to do step one. It's going to, it's going to cost $600,000 to do step one and two. And it's cost a million dollars to do step one, two, and three. What would, how, which path forward do you want to take? What are we going to do from here? And if you say that for now we just want to do step one or we just want to do step one and two, then the way that we will move forward with the work in the drawings is to make sure that we're always going to be able to come back at some point and finish up the project and do step three. Okay. It's clearer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because yeah. I, I do think you have a, a bigger vision on this than I was appreciating because it sounded like, I mean, I was interpreting it as, you know, we're just going to do this piece. That's and then it's a question of whether or not the rest of this stuff fit in. That's uh, yes. We're confident that with three hundred thousand dollars that's already been allocated to this building, we can take care of the step one, which is yes. the stabilization. I just don't know. I just don't know where we're going to get the funding for the rest of it. Yes, and that's, that's and, and you know, I think finally, I think that's one of the reasons why this came up versus some other shuttered building is the community said we'll help out and put their money where their mouth is. There's a ton of them out there. We can't afford to do them all. So we're looking to leverage some of our funds with the community funds to get more stuff happening. So I think that's what triggered that. My question, you know, the retaining walls that were torn down before, why were they removed? I'm sure. Right and that's, that's a great example of, of your question about a long-term vision. Let's, you know, not tear something down. I think what happened was they decided they were going to tear it down to so took out the retaining walls and like the retaining walls left space, um, like a walk sort of walkways in between the building is on a hill, so it's two level, one on Madison Road is at this level, and then the side um, that faces Fairfax is, is down at a higher level. So the sides of the building had these two walkways that came down, and the retaining walls were then on the outside of those walkways. But well, those walkways sort of made these little caves where stuff would happen and, you know, uh, people felt unsafe. So the, the, the decision then was they knocked down the retaining walls and then put earth up against the building. And 
that earth that's piled against the building, uh, and they took out the whole ramp and access to that south face of the building and covered all of that with dirt. They just brought earth up um, to secure that area, thinking I think that that building was just going to be knocked down someday. Um, but that earth is what's really causing a lot of problems because a lot of water is not able to seep down into the foundation of the building. So I think part of the first phase would be taking care of the really major issues um, that are deteriorating the building. Any other questions? If not, do we have a motion on this recommendation? I think what's being asked of us is to, are we approving $300,000 to advance the project or are we simply approving the um, securing a designer for the schematic design? I think we are approving $300,000 of which first expenditure will be to engage a, a designer. We have 300,000, as you know, sitting there today earmarked for Owl's Nest for the demolition. So we're saying put a new title on it, that it's not 300,000 for Owl's Nest demolition, but $300,000 to um, Owl's Nest graphic design, design and potential. Well, I think we, yeah, it will approve then. I think that the hope is that we get the design work done and stabilization with that $300,000. So hopefully we are approving today 300,000, which we're hoping will cover the stabilization versus tearing it down. Also, what we're saying is we're gonna keep the building. Yeah. Yeah. After we finish this, after we finish that schematic piece of design, the intent is to come back and to present to the board what our cost estimates are. So I, I can see what I can see why that's confusing. I think that's what we should be approving today. I mean, I think that we can generally earmark three hundred thousand dollars for this project and potentially more because you're going to be presenting three options to us. But right now, we don't even have a feel for what we would get for that $300,000 yeah. if we were to right. approve it. Right. So I think I would propose the motion be that we, we authorize the advancement of the schematic drawings with the expectation that you'll return in three months with the different options that we may pursue for this building. I would like to change the title, though, from Allison's Pavilion Demolition to Allison's Civilization on my little earmark. Or just Alice right. Nest redevelopment or something. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Well, I like um, your motion then, Molly, if I can be sure we're correct. We are approving funds necessary. Now, it, you'll have to come up with the number, but we are approving fund. We are approving the expenditure and the letting of an RFP for design services to be funded out of monies that we had previously earmarked for the demolition of Owl's Nest. Does that capture it? Right, thank you. Okay, so there, that's the motion. Is there a second? Second. In further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thanks. Thank you, Cindy. One more comment. Oh, yeah. This is not, a, this is not um, on the motion. But it is on how, and I think Cindy said it, how we describe what we're doing. It is not stabilization. I mean, because we're we're going beyond that. That's our plan at this point. That's the reason why we're doing this, right? That we want to go beyond stable, stabilizing this building. We That's want, certainly the intent. So it's That's the intent. It's yeah. something that is a lot more aspirational to me, should mm -hmm. be the title. Owl's nest. Yeah. Renovation, revitalization, redevelop Redevel something yeah. that captures, because we could do a project where we have a building, all we want to do is keep it from falling down. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're looking at doing here. Correct. So I just want our language to reflect our intention. And the next time that I come back, it will be to approve entering into contract negotiations mm -hmm. for whoever the design consultant is that we get. Okay. Thank you. Can I offer a timing? At least though, as Chris Morton mentioned, three months, and the staff had said on the order of six months. And I think by the time a designer is selected and negotiated and then they do their work, I think 
six months is probably more relevant than three. I think I said two. You said two. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to tie us down to a time frame here. Um, and I didn't go into that whole topic, but I think this is a project where I listened to the, the pickleball guy before here. I'm sorry to call Gary a pickleball guy. <laughs> but he said, I mean, it's basically been now 29 months that they've been talking about this. And it's going to be another five months before we have a contract in place to actually go out and do things. So it shouldn't take this long. And that's where I would encourage you to do what you can to get an RFP out and come back to us as quickly as possible, knowing that it's not going to be at our January meeting. I think moving with all due speed urgency absolutely pervasively throughout the system is important and a shared goal. I just heard two different numbers of months and wanted to flag that conversation. Uh, I think nothing would make us happier to be back in three months. I don't know with procuring guidelines if. <laughs> If that could happen, that would be fantastic. That's I fair. To, in the interest of full transparency, that's fair. That. That's fair. I will just add even in a private sector right now, engaging an architect for a project, start dates right now are often six months from now for them to even start the project. It was towards that. It's very fast. I think I was having a good time. All right. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you for the community people that are here for this as well. Okay. Now we'll move into something that's not nearly as complicated as Owl's Nest Park. Boat dock award recommendation. Do I have to leave still? Oh, I'm sorry, you have to leave. Still, even though it's no longer an issue. Yeah. To you. That's, that's what I've been told. Okay, just fine. Yeah. And I would I would like to just I just like to format this discussion today in the fact that we are at a point where we we are going to make a recommendation, I hope, today. But I think we should, and we'll hear a little bit more from the city solicitor today. Jenny's going to present some information. But I think it's really incumbent on us to step back and say, what is it that we want? What is it that we want for this project? And I think if we take it up to that level, as opposed to focusing strictly on what may be in front of us or um, things that have gone before us and questions that have been raised, but really approach this from a standpoint of what it is that we want out of this project. So with that, why don't we start with, with Jenny making your presentation? Sure. Uh, at the uh, last meeting, which I <coughs> believe the request was the November 11th meeting. Um, however, we were asked to uh, form a uh, committee uh, with our staff. So we did that with the waterfront staff, planning, finance, and uh, myself to review the documentations, the best and final offers that were submitted um, to the city. Uh, and my job was to explain the original proposal, the presentation that was provided to me as an evaluation committee member, and as well as the best and final. So we reviewed all that information, looked at the best and final, and what you have in front of you today are just some of the highlights uh, that we have pulled from that information that was provided. Did not plan on going through each and every one of these. Um, however, if you have any questions on them, I am certainly willing to answer them. Uh, the areas that we did highlight were location, whether uh, the location uh, should be at public landing or whether the location should be at the Rippling Bridge. Guest experience that was provided uh, in the proposals. Um, and what I mean by that is what amenities would be offered on a headboat as well as uh, for transient voters. The financials, what the proposals included um, as, uh, in the best and final offer and uh, or look at the designs or concepts that were submitted. 
as well as uh, DEI goals and background and experience. So again, these are our highlights of what was presented in the best and final offers. And uh, I was hoping that this document would serve as kind of a quick hit as you were reviewing those proposals so that you could kind of see that they were touched upon. Um, so at this point, I will certainly open it up for any questions that you have, or uh, you had mentioned that the city solicitor has some. Be before we go to questions then, F, what is staff's recommendation to us based on your review of the proposals that you have? Our recommendation is to move forward with the original board recommendation for age, Hafner, and sons. And uh, so that we can uh, move forward with contract negotiations. And that means positioning of the boat dock where? That would position the boat dock at the public landing. Okay. Near the steamboat monument, uh, just west of, or I'm sorry, just east of the steamboat. Okay, so that's staff's recommendation to us. Yes. Kevin, Kevin Frank, are you online here that, that we can hear you? Yes, sir, I believe so. Can you hear me? We yep. can hear you. You look great this morning, Kevin. <laughs> Thank um, you, sir. Uh, can you, at the last meeting, there was questions raised by the commissioners on our flexibility or our um, or if there are restrictions as to what we can and cannot consider as we are looking at these proposals. And I think particularly there was uh, a concern raised by all the commissioners uh, about related to DEI scoring and that sort of thing. Uh, can you provide to us guidance on our approach to our deliberations today? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I'm just going to start out by saying normally in an RFP process, if a vendor does not meet the inclusion goals at the time they submit their proposal, mm -hmm. that proposal is to be excluded. And that's why both proposals from Hafner and Queen City were rejected uh, when we did the RFP back in the spring, I think that was. The uh, procurement rules do allow the manager under, I think it's 321.63 or 65, I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, we are allowed to invite changes or modifications from the proposals in order to determine which proposal is the most advantageous. So that's what we did. We call that informally the best and final proposals. That's not really a, a term used in the code, but that's what we've been calling it. So both vendors submitted best and final proposals uh, in July or August. Uh, at the time those proposals were submitted, Hafner had met the inclusion goals. In fact, they had exceeded the inclusion goals at the time. And Queen City had not. At that time, neither contractor for Queen City had complied with the inclusion goals according to their proposal. And there are two inclusion goals. One is called a WBE or Women owned business enterprise and the other one's an MBE, which is minority owned business enterprise. And the goals were 4% WBE and 2% MW, excuse me, MBE. Uh, so at the time of the submission, Hafner had met those goals and Queen City had not. And so when the review committee review panel analyzed the proposals, they gave a zero out of 10 score to Queen City, which was accurate. So I heard Mr. Sullivan before this meeting started say there was inaccurate scoring by the city. I don't think that was correct. I think it was proper for the committee to have given a zero score for non-compliance with the inclusion goals because neither one of Queen City's contractors had been qualified by the city at that point. Subsequently, however, um, the WBE contractor proposed by Queen City, they're called Manning Contracting, they have been qualified by the city. I don't know what percentage they meet. I have not run the numbers. So I don't know what percentage WBE um, qualification they've achieved, but you are allowed within your discretion as the board, you are allowed to consider that the Manning contracting uh, qualifies as a WBE contractor. However, as of yesterday, the other contractor proposed for the minority business enterprise goal of 2%, that contractor is called SURE, S-U-R-E, SURE Mechanical, has not been qualified by the city. 
So when Mr. Sullivan said before, their contractors are fully registered, as of yesterday, we did not find that to be true. You are still allowed to consider it. Like I said, this is not an RFP process at this point, so their, their proposal is still in front of you. You can certainly weigh the proposal still, um, but that's where we see the status of the inclusion goals at this point. Okay. Are there questions on process or restrictions, rules, or is everybody clear? Okay. I have a question for yeah. you, Jenny. <clears throat> um, after we get to the point of approving you know, which direction to go here, how will the board be engaged from this point forward? Typically what happens is we will go into contract negotiations with the vendor and create a, an official contract for you to review before it is signed. And what do you, I understand you're not at that point, but what would be incorporated in that contract? Mostly where I'm getting to is what level of input will we be allowed to have on the way this facility operates, is oriented to both the public landing and the river and the boaters? What opportunity will we have to provide input on finishes or anything? Will we have any input opportunity whatsoever? I may misspeak here, so Kevin, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe once we go into contract negotiations, um, any of that information is available to you for us to, to describe and, and I, that is my understanding as well. And this is a circumstance where I think you can have as much or as little input that you would like. And as it relates to final contract for this, if we are further concerned about um, finishes, whatever, I think we can direct staff to say either you want to participate in some of this or that we want feedback as we're moving along in the process versus at the end when it's crafted. So I think what we have today in front of us is what was in the proposal. We've seen pictures, but as far as the detail finishes and what would be included in a contract, that's part of this whole next process that we as commissioners can have as much or as little input as we want. I just want to go, you know, for the record, approach to this facility is it's at, you know, it's between Sawyer Point and Snail Park, and there's been a tremendous amount of money invested in this riverfront, and we want this boat dock to reflect that world-class destination, <laughs> and I, I just want us to be really committed to that and partnered in that goal. And, and I appreciate that, and that's exactly what I, I'm glad I, I'm hearing that because I think what I started off the conversation is that I think we, we should express what, what it is we're looking for so that then we can best judge what we have in front of us. I'll take it a next step further as well. From my perspective, I look at the boat dock as just another opportunity for bringing people to our parks. So I don't see it, maybe I see it like a trail, you know, I, and I know I'm thinking trail because I was at a, at a groundbreaking yesterday for a trail, but it's a means to bring people from one place to another. We, we have built, I, we have built a beautiful park down there. We have a Banks Entertainment District down there. In my perspective, I view this boat dock as an opportunity of reaching out to another community to bring them to, to connect them to the parks that we have already, the entertainment center we have there already. I don't view the boat dock, and this is just my personal opinion, I don't view it as the destination or that we are looking to bring in people to the boat dock. I see the boat dock as a connection either with the river community or a connection between other places coming in to take advantage of the beautiful park that we have there already in the entertainment district that we have already. So that's the way I'm approaching and that's the way I'm thinking about as I'm considering these two, two proposals, um, what best 
meets that connect connectivity and I hate to say it functionality, but it's almost the functionality of that boat dock. I just finally add thanks again for all the hoops you've jumped through to bring us more transparency on these proposals. I know it's set us back because it's been the <coughs> fastest process, <laughs> but we appreciate it. So I think to facilitate, and Jenny, you can stand or sit as you want, Perhaps the way that we can approach this is let's discuss the two proposals and maybe questions, pros, cons, how you feel about it. Uh, we've got Queen City River boats. We have their proposal. Uh, I will note that we did receive 20, 27 pages last night of additional information re relating to I that. Did, I did issue that to you in a hard copy. Yeah, I did find it in my file as well. Aware. But I will open it up for questions, comments, as it relates to the proposal in front of us from Queen City River Boats. Question I have, you don't have to stand on. <laughs> <laughs> um, the location of the dock, how much was that in your you know, thought process as to uh, uh, your recommendation? So the location of the dock was more considered, uh, which would be uh, able to function better. Mm -hmm. So on the public landing, it can function better right. at that location sure. than at the road link, what exists now and what resources would need to be provided in order to make the road link area um, accessible. Um, as I stated in here, you know, our normal summer pool at river level is 26 feet. At 31, the location at the Roebling Bridge uh, goes underwater. So unless there was something in the proposal that showed us that that ramp could go up to the span level and that would be incorporated in that design, um, I was not able to consider anything beyond 31 feet. Okay. Most voters um, certainly, you know, use the river. I've been told around 40 to 42 feet, 42 might be a little aggressive, but that's what, what I've been told. So uh, for me, the location at the, um, and the committee, uh, the location at the Rogley Bridge certainly posed a large problem because I did not think that that location would be functional or operational past 31 feet and for a lot of the season. Okay. And for clarity, what we're talking about is that in what you're saying is your preferred location, the head boat would be below like where the, the uh, steamboat uh, wheel. wheel is. That's correct. It might be a little east of that. It yes. would, okay. A little so bit it's up east. river from? It's up river from the suspension bridge. Right, but relative to the steamboat wheel. It's straight down. It's down, down, it's so down there's river the Broadway front. tunnel and above the Broadway tunnel is the paddle wheel. Mm -hmm. The head boat would need to be placed just east of that in order for the ramps to be able to access the public landing and move up and down the public landing. Right, so it would be at the furthest westernmost end of the public landing. That's correct. Is where the head boat would start and right. then move like down to, river. Is there so a it's, good picture of there? I'm not sure. It's where the so are, it's up river. It's up. It's with a river. I prefer up river or down river. Okay. So west. here okay. is the paddle wheel. That's here. the paddle, and this is yes. the start of the head boat. That's right correct. There. So okay. the ramps would gotcha. move on the public landing. Gotcha. Would you like okay. me to share that yeah. Yeah. with you guys as well so you understand? And for clarity, that is what is proposed by the Hafner proposal. I believe what we have. So my understanding is that location is what is in the Hafner proposal. My understanding from documents we received subsequent from Queen City is that 
their position is if we said we wanted that location that they would also reconfigure their their um, setup so that they would do the same thing. It's not part of the proposal, but that's what they have indicated. And you can say yes or no, am I correct? Yes. Okay. We wanted it there, obviously. I, we heard, yeah. Okay. So that's location. Other questions, comments? So Jay, based on what was presented, your, um, the basis for the recommendation weighed heavily on location. Am I understanding? I'm not saying it weighed heavily. I think the items that um, certainly weighed overall were uh, location was one, uh -huh. um, financials were the other, the guest experience as far as uh, not necessarily in location wise, but what both proposals were offering for guests to come uh, once they reached the head vote, what they would enjoy on the head vote or the opportunity for uh, Hafner um, offered free voting on the, um, on a daily basis. They would not be charged unless they were uh, staying multiple days. I felt that was a very viable opportunity for voters to come and enjoy not only the, the marina, but also the rest of the city. Um, and in addition um, to that were um, the DEI goals as per the process. So the location for me was not something that was a heavy concern. Okay. Um, certainly, it was scored as presented, uh, but did know that you know if we got into to the point of contract negotiations, that that opportunity could change. Uh, that, but I was to score it as presented in the proposal. Understand? Yeah. I was very intrigued by the fact that one and a half the proposal offered free access, and I thought, I drive my car downtown, there's nowhere I can park free. And so I was just wondering about, I don't know, that just, I don't know if there's specific rationale for that, is that bringing more people or whatever, so. It's just, certainly uh, in their presentation that they provided to us uh, at the evaluation committee, they certainly spoke about the importance of having that daily free access uh, so that they could enjoy either the restaurant was there or the other amenities such as the parks that we have as well as the rest of the city. And because that is something that is offered over in Kentucky, maybe not at a scale of this nature, but at uh, some other restaurants there, they felt it was important to uh, follow that, that model. To me, that was, that specific item was a real positive to the Hafner proposal in my mind, because as a city park, as an opportunity to draw people in, the fact that we could offer to them free daily mortgage just to come in, enjoy the city, enjoy the park, enjoy uh, the entertainment district. Uh, to me, that was a very positive I, I think from a city standpoint and from a park standpoint, it, it's sort of like what I was saying, where we're encouraging people to come and using it as a draw to the, the great park that we have down there in the business district. I think it is. I agree with you that it is quite attractive um, to be able to park. Doc, this is the right <laughs> term. Yeah. Um, you know, from my perspective, when we look at then the fiscal project itself, there's, I think we're being told it's similar. We're gonna have a head boat with a, boat, with a restaurant bar with the dock out below it. Uh, so it's apples to apples there, I, I believe. There, there is a big difference in pro formas that you know, being a financial guy, I, I, I of course spend a little time on the performance. And uh, I would say the Hafner proposal in my mind 
more of the profit sharing or the sharing of revenues was greater in the Hefner proposal in my mind. I would have to say that as far as pro formas, uh, no offense, but I, I, I put, I think that the, the bar restaurant operation proposal that Hafner gave us was significantly higher on the bar restaurant aspect of that than what was presented to us in a pro forma by Queen City. Queen City's reflected a net operating profit of 7% versus um, Hefner's proposal assumed a 60%. So there's a big difference there. And uh, I would have to say that I, I believe that uh, it might be too aggressive of estimates on the bar restaurant. However, when you look at the docking operations, we have the inverse, where you have Hafner, uh, where you have Queen City Riverboats was assuming that we would have $144,000 of dockage income or whatever we call it, revenues. And Hafner's proposal only projected $79,000. So as I'm looking at it from a financial standpoint, I think that we maybe, when I look at the Hafner proposal, we get a larger portion of the bar and uh, restaurant revenue, but I think it may be a little overstated. So I think in actuality, I would look at this and think, okay, we'll get a little bit less. Is it, but because we're getting a big percentage, even if it comes down a little bit, I think we're still within a, a range of what I think we should expect. When I look at the dockage, I think that's where there is opportunity in the Hafner pro forma that we could, there's opportunity for improving that. And when you look at that, we get 75% of the dockage re revenues. So in my mind, the upside potential in the Hafner proposal related to dockage is greater. The bar restaurant, I think is smaller, but I think it's more than offset by the opportunity. And I, and I don't wanna try and get too deep in the weeds here, but I think from a pro forma, um, I think that I know one of the contentions that has been made by Queen City is that really, their revenues would be greater if you took into consideration things like the boat taxi that came over and the number of people that were coming over to then spend money in the banks and on things like that. I would not say that it is significantly better. And in fact, I would still grade if I were grading, which I'm not, I would say that there is more opportunity for revenue sharing on the Hafner side even though I believe their bar and restaurant pro forma might be a little too aggressive. I think that's the point. It's, it's all going to come down to how well this is operating. Right. The, the, the share can, can be anything, but whatever the net bottom line is going to be, what's going to drive that share, and that's going to be based on how well this facility is operated. Right. I know one of the things presented in the material that we got overnight from Queen City um, addresses some of the criticism that we have heard through the community as far as um, Coast Guard violations. And it's something that city procurement followed up with them specifically that there were a number of citations by the um, by the Coast Guard for boats that were owned by Queen City. Uh, they provided an explanation that it was Queen City's explanation is that they acquired the fleet of boats two years ago and that it's taken them two years to get them into appropriate condition with, with the Coast Guard. Um, there's been 
reporting, and I've seen some statistics where in actuality, when people went back and looked at the citations, there were actually more citations after the acquisition of the of the, the boat fleet than what there was before. And so there was questions about the operation as, as we're talking about here. One of the key arguments made by Queen City in the documents that we've received over the past couple of days is their operational expertise and their marine expertise. Um, I think in my mind, I, I somewhat slice and dice that. Some of the expertise is drawn upon the combination of the businesses. Uh, two years ago, uh, when the property was bought in Kentucky for development, along with it was the required acquisition of this business. And at the time, comments made by Queen City was they weren't, weren't even sure what they were gonna do with this marine business, either move it somewhere or even sell it off. Uh, and the decision was then to partner with somebody that was in the marine business. So when I look back, yeah, years of experience, running a, a, a hotel restaurant and all that stuff is different than the experience has brought from the Marine over the past couple of years. So um, as I look at it, one of the contentions from Queen City was that by far their operational experience and expertise outweighs um, the other proposal. And I'm, and I'm not sure that I, I fully agree with that based on information about management and how things had been run. Um, Jim, if I could, here's, here's where I am on this. Um, we met earlier this year in the presentation at the Friendship Park Pavilion. And at that time, we as a board said, this is not enough information for us to make a motion on staff's recommendation. We'd like this opportunity to review the proposals, to interface with the proposers on this and hear and see more. And we did at a meeting a couple of meetings ago. And I was impressed with both. Um, I've also heard from a lot of people in the voting community. I know no one in the voting community, to be clear. I'm not a voter and I don't have any personal relationships with any voters. But I've heard very clearly, please, please, we want a vote doc. We need a vote doc. We've been pining for this for years. Please, 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 we want a vote doc. And, but I've also heard we got two great proposers for this vote doc. Both would be, will be able to execute this very well. And again, I think that was illustrated here. Um, candidly, I was quite impressed with Hafner when they arrived and gave the presentation. My biggest concern with Hafner coming in was an experience running a marina. And I felt very confident after the, after the presentation was made that they had the wherewithal to, to pull this off and operate it on a go forward basis. And I, I really don't have any basis to do anything other than support staff's recommendation for proceeding. Any other input? I will, I will express my um, thoughts as well. I believe that throughout this ordeal, which has been a very long drawn out process, uh, I do believe that the Hafner group has done everything that we ask of them to do. And I do believe that given the opportunity then to come before us and present their proposals, they came and sold the proposal that they had submitted and that they had provided to us. And I appreciate that approach. Um, and I'll be very candid. I feel like we continue as of last night, getting more information or trying to sell this proposal from Queen City. And from that standpoint, um, just me personally, it, it, it struck me as a little oversell. Um, and uh, this, the Queen City group has a lot on their table uh, with the development of the harbor across the river. Um, there's a lot going on. I feel like with Hafner, we would get focused 
operations on this, even though it's not their core business. I, I, I think it's, it's a company that's been in Cincinnati, uh, as I read through here, for 98 continuous years of service. So I feel comfortable that it's a company that's not going to go away in, in a year or two. So, um, yeah, that's sort of where I'm leaning. So I, I don't know if there's any other questions, comments. And, and I also, Molly, to your point, uh, staff has been through, and, and Jenny, you have been through all the discussions on this. You have sat in on meetings along the way since May or March, whenever that was, and have a lot of information and a lot of interaction with both proposers. And I also would have a difficult time saying, even though your groups went through and made a recommendation to us that, that we would have strong enough reasons not to accept that. Mr. President, I, um, this, this whole idea of course was around prior to my joining the board, but I heard about it almost immediate, immediately. And we have had many conversations about it. This has been an incredible roller coaster. I was under the impression a year ago, I mean, I remember saying, oh, this is a wonderful private public coordination, a, a partnership here that's going to get us moving. And then of course we had to back off from that and take on the process that we've taken on. It's been a lot of learning in this process. First of all, about how we approach the city when we have these kinds of questions that's been that's been quite a learning. I think, as, a, as others have said, that we have two presentations or two proposals that are neck and neck if you just look at the numbers. So one of the things I was very much concerned about was the DEI, as I've always said and always question the zero versus 10. And so we get more information about that. And now we hear that, oh yeah, it's, it's really not that, it's still confusing. I think I, where I was, was if I have to go out as I often do and talk to people who are less informed than I am, about decisions we take and say, okay, so what was the basis for that? When I first heard, I thought, if I'm gonna go and tell people that I said, we've got a person, we've got a company that does boats, and we got a person, a company that does landscaping, and we wanna build a boat dock, and we're gonna get the landscapers that hasn't gone over well when I've had those conversations. But really, when you look at what we have been presented, I think, I think there's capability there, there to do what we are asking. Jim described um, this as, well, I'll, I'll say what I heard as I was listening to Jim's description is, we talk about the riverfront being the living room to our city. I thought about this boat out being the foyer. Not a lot has to happen there, it's just gotta be right. It's gotta, it's gotta be inviting. It's got to do the things to invite people in. And that's what we want to be able to do. I was intrigued by the prospect of making it even bigger, like make it a destination. We've been at this a long time, and I think to get on with it is what we ought to do. And so I think if you look at the numbers, and as we always do, rely on, as I always do, rely on the people who are closest to it, because they know the details far better than I ever could. I challenge my own going in assumptions about it. And so I appreciate all the work and all the time and all the challenges that you have had to face 
because it just didn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me initially. So I appreciate it. And I think I'm in a place where I can make a decision on it. Thanks to all of the information that's been presented to us. Anything else? No questions or comments from me. At, at this point then, I would like to recommend or, or accept a motion. And if there is someone that would like to make a motion as to uh, acceptance of one of the two bids as our selection to move forward with the negotiations. Are we at a point where we would like to make that motion? Can I, I make hear a motion, motion to accept the proposal recommended by staff? There's a motion to approve the recommended Hafner proposal. Is there a second to that? Second. Any further discussion before we go on? Let's do a roll call vote on this one, just for clarity. President Getz? Yes. Vice President Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Castellini is not present. Commissioner Linder? Yes. Commissioner Dark? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And what I would say, I, I very much appreciate Queen City's proposal and I, appreciate all of the time and energy and everything that you put into this proposal. And I also want to thank Hafner and I, and I appreciate the time and energy and we look forward to getting there. Jenny, if, if, if Tom, if you would help. Tom. Tom. John, <laughs> why did I go there? <laughs> John, if, uh, if you would help coordinate with the commissioners the degree of input. I think at minimum, what we would like, Jenny, is to have, before we get a final document, if we could along the way, whenever there's a, an idea of finishes, what this is gonna look like, um, feel free to say, John, put the, this on the agenda just to give us an update. Uh, no decision needs to be made, but get feedback from us. Or if people want to do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis with Jenny and her team, however you want to do that, I would encourage everybody to make sure that they are at a place when we ultimately have a contract to put forward that we, we feel comfortable with, with what, what is in it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, move on. Our next agenda item is urban forestry assessment. We can absolutely take a break. We're going to take uh, a break, five minute break, and we will come back to discuss the urban forestry proposal.
We're back in session here. And Mr. Nyer, I'm, I'll call you Mr. Nyer, so I don't. I, I have been called worse. <laughs> um, I just caught up with Crystal for a second. I know Crystal and her team did a uh, extensive bordering on uh, exhaustive uh, report with uh, a lot of terrific data and using the GIS resources that are really uh, cutting edge and well deployed to this purpose. And I just wanted to kind of give a, a, a table setting point to the extent uh, we're going to give commissioners all credit for being literate. So if you <laughs> want to go into particular sections of particular areas of concern, Chris didn't do that. She has forgotten more than I will ever know uh, about this subject. But, but the headline, if I can cover, is that due to uh, escalating prices through all the labor pools, the more specialized, the more intense the increase is. And being in a tree with a chainsaw is relatively specialized and com comes relatively dear. So due to uh, increases in that service, which are well documented on a national level, um, and also our increased canopy. And I'm going to get this number wrong, but I think we've gone from 39% to 43, 43. 38 to 43. 38 to 43. So it's a 10% increase in canopy from this model was instructed. Uh, we are requesting the board's approval to take the council to a, uh, a request to increase the assessment up to 31 cents per lineal foot, which we acknowledge is a significant increase on a percentage basis. Um, because of the way this is calculated, the impact on an average homeowner is, is not as dramatic as some other increases might be that way. Uh, but with that, we, we would, where we're heading is we'd like your approval to make that increase. There is a lot of backup that's sort of constructing. There were really three, but kind of four viable alternatives uh, suggested, one of which was well, we should plant less trees because we can't afford to take care of the trees. And that's that's not what that's not sure that anyone's like. We're all here because we like parks and trees. Um, but that's when you know, there, there, this is algebra, and there, there's only so much on each side that you can move. Uh, so that's where we're heading is to a request increase. And I think there's a lot of business case developed for that. And to the extent you have questions on that, I want to explore specific areas further. Crystal is here and ready, um, but I just want to kind of set that table if I met. Before deferring people much better equipped than myself to deal with that. Crystal, I have just one question before you get started. We heard today about Mr. Gallagher and his role in the Urban Forestry Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us, give us some description of that board, what it what it does, and how it was engaged with this recommendation? Yes, ma'am. We actually have a board member here today, Mr. Reno. He's been on the board for quite some time here. Um, so they are an advisory board to the director. They're made up of, currently made up of four community members. Uh, two of those are from, one is from the green industry, one is from the business community, two are community members at large, and then there are staff appointed roles on that board as well. So we have an appointee from the, um, the Department of Transportation and Engineering. So both the city architect and the city engineer sit on that board, as well as a representative from uh, the city's planning department and then our urban forestry supervisor and serves as the chair. And then our, our administrative technician, Sheila Stump, and our office, she serves as the secretary. So um, in general, we have, we have to have at least six meetings a year. All of the procedure for the urban forestry board is guided by the Cincinnati Municipal Code, um, the urban forestry section of the Cincinnati Municipal Code, which defines how many board members we have, how often they should meet, all those different aspects. Uh, the core function of their creation, from my understanding in the beginning, was to be an appeal board for any appeals that we may have from community members for the decisions that were being made by the urban forestry program. So you want your tree cut down, I tell you no, you can go and appeal to the board who would make a recommendation to the director as to how to proceed. Aside from that, we also, at every meeting, we're going through monthly updates about the program. This is where we're at in the maintenance cycle. This is how far we are behind. This is how we, our plan is to get caught up. Um, but one of the most important functions is this budgetary aspect. So every year, the assessment goes before this board to just because they know our program, they know our inner workings very well. Uh, so we present our budget first to them to get guidance on, you know, what do you think the feedback from the community would be? Uh, how do you feel about this assessment increase or keeping the assessment the same? Are there any other programs that you would, that you would like us to invest in? that would need to increase the budget, um, they make their recommendation to this board from that meeting as to the direction that they want to go. 
Uh, I'm sorry, they make their recommendation to the director as to what direction they want to go, and uh, that's where we're at today. So they approved up to 31 cents at their October meeting. So they've been through this analysis in detail. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. It was much more high level at that point. Um, since then, we really dug in to make sure across all of our T's and dotted all of our I's, and we're able to present it in a format that, you know, expecting that ultimate decision making for this goes to council. We have a whole new council, so they don't know our program yet, uh, unless they do, which is, would be phenomenal. But my assumption is that they don't. So. Uh, that's why the report and this PowerPoint presentation is the goal was to be as comprehensive as possible to really in, in, inform the decision makers what the purpose of the urban pollution program is and why we have this need at this point. Mm -hmm. Crystal, I don't know if you know the history of the uh, increases over the course of time, but I think. We went when since you and I have been on the board. I think we went from 17 to 19, 19 right. to 21, right. mm -hmm. and now 21 to 31. But my recollection was we were at 17 for a long, long time. And I, I don't know if that's if that's true or not. But uh, does anybody know how long yeah. we were at 17? That that was a long period of time. And I went back and looked, and the numbers that we got in 2017, 18 were flat and then in 2019 which you're talking about we did increase it slightly and that slight increase went from 1.9 million to 2.2 million in our coffers so it's it's about $115,000 for every for every penny tenth of a every, tenth of a no, cent yeah i think cent. it's tenth of a cent whatever it is um, so that any of these increases that we have made, it was flat for so long, then it went up a little bit and it- We're catching up. Catching up. And I will say through that time, we did get behind. Our preventative maintenance cycle mm -hmm. in several mm -hmm. districts are two to three years behind. So mm -hmm. this is kind of the catch up that we've been trying to do since I started. Uh, there were lots of you know elements that went into why we were behind, be it budgetary constraints, dealing with emerald ash borer, removal of ash trees throughout the entire city, um, to contractual issues with purchasing. Uh, so we, since I started, we pretty much changed the program the way that we do our contractual services. And as I reported out in the report, you know, in the past year, we put almost everything out to bid again. And what we're seeing is, is a mass inflation in, in the cost of doing this business. So let's, let's give it to you. We've been peppering you with questions already. You tell us what you want to present to us. So I have... I have basically reiterated everything that's in that report in the PowerPoint presentation. John asked if, uh, if we just wanted to go into question and answer um, and give the board the opportunity to you know, ask questions based on your review of the report. Um, or if you would like me to go through the, the full presentation, I can do that as well. Uh, but for the sake of time, and, and you know, yeah. if you guys feel that you're at a point to make a decision or ask questions, I'm happy to take them. I, I I don't think we have to go through because I think we've all spent mm -hmm. time reviewing this. Mm -hmm. I I want you to tell us what what we need to do for you for this program. Tell us exactly what, what we need to do from, from your perspective. Yes, sir. I appreciate that opportunity. Um, so in essence, we're looking at if we were to continue business as usual, and the way that the urban forestry assessment is set up is the decision that we're making today will inform our fiscal year 24 budget. So between the rest of this fiscal year and all of next fiscal year, we're still operating at 21 cents per one year. Budget. So we'll continue to backslide for another 18 months, 24 yes, months. Yes, sir. Um, Fred, being the wonderful mathematician and CFO that he is, has ran all these projections to show, okay, if we increase our budget, for fiscal year 24 to at least 29 cents per linear foot, then we can continue spending as we have, borrowing forward, but we would not be in the red because of, am I saying so? Sorry. For the projections, yeah. So projected now when the revenue comes in, we would not go into the negative or the unbalanced for 792, or we would remain positive. But like long term, that's what we're focusing on. It's mm -hmm. the 31 cents is addressing, we know what's occurring today as well. 
like that 29th century we're looking at, that gets us to today. But we know what's going on with the environment right now with labor, that there could, there's probably going to be significant inflation or will be significant inflation going forward. So that's where that 31 cents can help address that and catch us up. Get us on that. Really, what we want the urban forestry division to provide to the cities is that into the citizens. Okay. Crystal, Absolutely. when you contract, how long is that for a year that uh, you contract out, or is it uh, multiple years with uh, arborists? So they're generally one year contracts with two optional renewals. So two with some, years. With some increased opportunity for them to increase, or they're, it's so to just renew they're committing years. for three years then? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so to get back to the question, so if we went to 29 cents as Craig alluded to, we would be able to maintain baseline operations that would allow us to just move forward as we have been, contracting out all of our services. Um, if we were to move to 31 cents, that would allow us to stash away the 10% reserve that the city's finance department recommends for all budgets. Um, as well as explore other options, like hiring an in-house tree crew, breaking ourselves of the dependency um, on contractual work 100%, because that's pretty much where we're at today. We have a group in our urban forestry department, none of the classifications allow these individuals to keep the ground, nor do they have the skill set to do so. So at the 31 cents, we would, we would be looking at procuring equipment, and potentially bringing in a tree crew leader and two tree maintenance workers to offset the cost of maintaining anything below 25 inches in diameter. So right now, that's where our greatest costs are, between that and our emergency maintenance. So right now, whenever we go out, if we have a tree that's hung up and another tree, we have to call the contractor who comes down from Dayton and charges us roughly, what is it, about 400 an hour? Um, uh, oh, um, oh uh, overtime, during overtime. But well, not like 195 or regular hour, but double, yeah. So evening and weekends, which is when, you know, we're generally being- That's it always hour. happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing four times the normal rate. Uh, is there a trip charge from Dayton too? Or is that just there built a, into their- They charge, they charge from, from their local office, which is their station out of Sharon Miller area right now. That's where they reposition the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I, and I believe that's built into the contractual cost. Um, there's an additional hauling fee for every diameter inch tree that they're removing, they have a certain uh, hauling fee that's associated with that. So for me, and uh, John asked this question, if you could wave a magical wand and, and create the, the perfect program, I would, I would have someone on my team that I can send out on these evenings and weekends to address simple things. I would continue to have a contractor in place to address the things that are above and beyond the scope of, of a of the operation that we have with just one small tree crew. But to not have a tree crew, to not have the ability to leave the ground and your business is trees, I think is ridiculous. It's faulty. Mm -hmm. And I think it leaves us to the industry's discretion as to what our budget is going to look like. At least I feel like with the crew, we can, we can begin to break some of those dependencies and maybe even streamline some of these contractual services to potentially bring the cost down. Because really what we found with the EM contract is that we only had two bidders. So we had Davy Tree Service and we had Tree Care Inc., both our large East Coast operations. But your small mom, mom and pop shops can't even bid on, on a contract to that scale because you're working at a citywide scale. You have mm -hmm. to be able to be here within two hours, have all the equipment to run, and if the tornado hits, like you're on the line. We would still want to have that, that ability. But um, right now, with our full dependency being on contractual services for everything from individual workforce, from the tree that's touching your house, uh, to being able to respond to a call out in the middle of the night, I think I think is hamstrung us. And I was reading that as either or. But what you're saying is doing both things, having somebody on staff and also having the, uh, the uh, ability to contract. Absolutely. So we have some massive trees in the city of Cincinnati yeah. um, that really take, you know, crane operation, you know, five, 10 person mm -hmm. crew, semis to get the wood out. So we would definitely have some aspects that would still need to be attracted. Yeah. Okay. And one crew can't do it all. And if I heard you correctly, that's only, that's only possible if we increase up to the 31 to have buffer, to be able to hire more people. 
in Pels? Yes, so the initial investment in equipment and staff would, would bring would be at least 30 cents in fiscal year 24. If we got that green light today, we would have to start that process right now in order to have equipment and people in place to start in fiscal year 24, just based on the bureaucracy of acquiring fleet and personnel. Um, but at 31 cents, uh, that gets us to the to the even broader spectrum, better emergency response, still having to contract. We're not going to build for every tree that could fall. That's not economically right. viable. But uh, at 31, we can have a stronger, more robust program, explore and hopefully proceed with that internal piece, which increases response, improves response time, does not increase it, improves response time, and gives us a broader range of capabilities in house, which is nice because you can control it. One thing I wanted to call out here on day six on the job um, is. I am sensitive to the fact that this is a material increase. This is this is this is sizable, and uh, taxpayers are not looking for more increases. However, if you look at other major metros in Ohio, we would still be even thirty one. We would be on the order of forty percent lower than the comparable cities that that calculated this in the same way. So I'm entirely comfortable that it's still a leading value for the homeowners uh, who are putting this burden uh, eventually. But still, get, it gets us to a much stronger response. It's a, it's a better return on the investment for the home, mm -hmm. yeah. even though it's a larger mess. Mm -hmm. And that that's helpful because when I first looked at it, and, and I thought about the the incremental increases we've had over the time that I've been aware of it, um, this was a big step, and 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 it was hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. But what was missing for me, and I think we talked about this earlier, is what is the real impact mm -hmm. on a homeowner? Mm -hmm. You know, it's this, if, if you say, if I just hear, you, I'm going from paying 21 to 31, that sounds like a big number. But the real impact is how do you, how do you frame that relative to other increases that we might see as homeowners? I can't speak to the other increases that you would see as homeowners, but I can speak to this assessment due to the, the due diligence and good work that Matt Zabona has done by streamlining this through a GIS-based process. And so on average at 21 cents per linear foot, the average cost of property owners is about $13. Okay. With a going to 30 cents per linear foot, we would be looking at the average homeowner paying $19. Mm -hmm. The majority of these costs are not are, are within your escrow or within the property taxes. So um, the, the largest impact for this increase is going to come down to what the city pays. The city bill will go up because the city covers the cost for all public properties and intersections. Mm -hmm. So that's city, state, federal, and the intersections. So there would be a market <coughs> increase for the city overall, but for the average property owner, by keeping with the linear footage, yes, I feel like it's it'll be a blip that most. Maybe. I wanted to just lend that for myself because I wanted to know what is this going to cost. Yeah. And I'm coveted double lot in a historical neighborhood, <laughs> which means I'm a whole one third of an acre. All right. <laughs> there it is. And it's um, so I have a lot of the linear footage mm -hmm. as compared to my neighbors. And we're going from $21 a year to $31 a year. So it's less than a dollar a month. Um, and I think this increase of to 43% tree canopy is enormous. And there's still a lot of work to do. I remember one of the first meetings I attended here, you showed us the GIS coverage and some of the loss of tree canopy that's been experienced, for instance, in Oakley with all the development that's happened in Oakley. So, as we look at growing the city, development will continue to grow, but that also means continuing to nurture our tree population, and we've got a responsibility to that. And then, of course, when you plant the trees, you've got to take care of them when they fall down or when a branch comes down in the street or in somewhere, you know. So it's like children. They don't break a knee. So I think, you know. Chainsaws and children don't go. <laughs> You know, you think we'd have a lot of questions, or that I would have a lot of questions because the significant I don't want to understate the significance of increasing costs to the residents of Cincinnati. But you've done a very comprehensive mm -hmm. job uh, reviewing this in great detail. As I said, I had to read it twice because it's dense. 
I feel very confident in your and your team's ability to carry out this program successfully as you've done. And I completely support the need for the additional funding to support the program as we continue to grow and to treat City USA. Yeah. And you know, I would like to probably understand the dynamics of uh, how we approach council with this, and then also engage with you directly on how we can directly or should directly engage with council members to advocate for this understanding it is a new council. Yeah. I think I would echo that, you know, the the work that went into this is so commendable because it's it's fact based and it really paints a picture for us. And we're, we're definitely faced with. We say that we want to plant more trees yeah. <laughs> and we've been successful. And because of our success with that, as Molly said, comes more cost. And you have done a good job of painting the picture here where if we don't get the increase, we just can't plant more trees. Yeah, so I right. think a, a couple of things and to the last point Molly was making, I think somehow we've got to come up with an executive summary. I think we have to, as you're thinking about going to the city and the good part about this is that we partner with city council on this. You know, we, we present the information to them and it's a good opportunity for us to partner with the new council and mayor and say, I, because I think the priorities are going to be the same, where we want to be a green city. We, we want to address climate change, which uh, tree canopy is a huge part of that. So I don't think that there's going to be a difference in the dedication. I think Mayor Cranley has been a huge proponent of trees and getting more planted. So I think we're going to have a kind of continuation of that. So right out the gate, it gives us an opportunity to sit with this new council and say, this is a priority. It's our priority. It's your priority. How are we going to pay for it? And there's options there. The only option we have to recommend is the ability to increase or recommend an increase to the assessment. I am also very attuned to what property costs are, property tax costs are in, in this region. But council, we're asking them to partner with us to say, how, how can we bridge this gap of funding? If we don't want to go to the property owners, then the other option council has is to find another source through general fund or through the general fund process to provide the additional funds that we'll need. But it will give us a good opportunity right away to interact with them and, and you know, start off as a partnership with city council to say collectively, this is our problem. How can we do it? How would you like to do it? So I would just encourage as you're planning that, that's that's the approach. I think there is an education needed around this urban forestry function. It's everybody understand new park is exciting. Swing set people understand how do those trees happen? I don't think that's as broadly understood. It's kind of it's the vegetables of the parks. I don't think it's a top billing, but it's very important to the overall health of the system. So I think this is a great opportunity to educate. Uh, some some newer folks who haven't been exposed to that, uh, yeah, and, and yeah. hopefully uh, gain their support as well. And throughout the nation, urban forestry is managed differently. Um, you look at other cities; it's the residents' property responsibility to maintain the tree that's in front of their house. In those cities, you're also seeing some of the highest growing heat islands mm -hmm. in the nation. Louisville being the, the closest example. The program that we have in Cincinnati is an urban forestry model. We have been engaged by the city of Boulder throughout the past year through various iterations of interviews just to go through how we operate. Uh, Matt Devona and I sat down with them ecstatic to talk about our program. So we've been asked to come after they interviewed all the urban portrait programs throughout the nation. They identified five that are the best examples of what Boulder can be in Cincinnati as well. So I think this will allow us to continue that legacy and even build upon it. Looking at what we're thinking with the biochar project and what we can do in partnership with MSD and getting more trees planted on residential properties. I think just the service that this program provides to the city is not only an essential function, but a great gain and a great benefit to being a citizen resident. Of course, we're a model for Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> <Duh. laughs> uh, the only other comment I would make, and it's something that uh, John and John discussed as well is that the incremental going to ask for 28, then perhaps 29, then really needing to get to 31, the differential is so small 
that we may, my gut feeling is go, go to the 31, it. you know, rather than hit, hit additional times, knowing that that will get us where we need to be. I think uh, that would be my recommendation to us. I appreciate that. And I know that in order to do so, it's going to take great confidence on our part to advocate for that at the city level. Yeah. And then I'm ready. I think the additional piece is certainly we need to advocate at the city level. I think there's opportunity for education and awareness at the citizen level. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think we've yep. done a great job. We're doing a great job. I like what we did about with um, tree planting this year, identifying the areas where we most needed to improve the mm -hmm. canopy, making trees available to those areas first. Mm -hmm. I think that helped people start to understand the critical importance of trees in our city. Mm -hmm. And so as people understand the benefit, yeah. then paying for that benefit becomes easier, I think. Yes, ma'am. And with the urban tree canopy assessment uh, wrapping up here by, by next month, the preliminary data, as I mentioned multiple times, we're getting back on this, it is just phenomenal. Like it, that in and of itself is at a national scale. Um, but what my plan is, is to break that down into every individual neighborhood. Yes. Go to each neighborhood and do a UTC roadshow and just say, this is urban forestry. This is the service you're providing for. Uh, Great. Here's where your canopy stands. Yes. Here's my recommendation as an arborist and as your city forester, where we want them here. Let's do it. Yes. So and we have some amazing partners in the city that are on that same page. Great. The only comment I would make regarding this, because I'm 100% behind everything that you're doing, is that there's a lot of federal money floating around. And Cincinnati has been given a lump sum of that federal money. And the way it's being appropriated, it has not been correct. And the laws keep changing on that. And I, I would encourage you to stay tuned and to get your or into that federal money. And, um, and, and get the city corrected in the way that they are appropriating it. Well, and that goes back to what we're talking about with having partners with the city council, because this is our, all of our problems. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it is, if we are going to be a green city and promote tree canopy, this is, this is a cost that comes along with us. So it would encourage them to say, you know, you've got options here. And if there's opportunities with federal funding, Hey, perfect, perfect way to do it. We will absolutely be pursuing that. There's, there's a plethora of opportunities that are coming out funding wise, and especially with partners like Groundwork, Ohio River Valley, and MSD at the helm, ready to, to seize the day on that as well. What I could foresee that funding being utilized is outside of the right of way. Uh, definitely think you can do great, great service in the right of way through. Uh, soil cell investment and things of that nature to really improve the places where the trees are growing within the streetscape. But a big push that MSD has is trying to manage point source stormwater on private property and on property that individuals may not have the ability to invest $250 in a tree. So they're willing to invest money into the biochar project, which will increase the water and nutrient water capacity of the soil. We partner that with uh, Groundwater Harbor Valley to do some the tree planting for an individual, be them elderly, unable, unknow unknowing of what species to choose. Um, that's where the rubber really hits the road. That's like where I think that people really start to feel connected to the canopy, connected to the, the public servants that serve them. Uh, so we're on the lookout. <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys hearing the information as to how I can utilize from an urban forestry standpoint, because it is very complex, that federal funding piece of it. Um, I'm happy to take it and run with it. If you have some semblance of understanding to get us there. Perfect. Great. Any other questions for Crystal? No. If not, we'll I, need- I have one. Ahead, yeah. uh, do you envision eventually taking your, call it internal crew from a 25 inch caliper to uh, 36 inch caliper tree to work on, or or is, is that kind of the sweet spot that you say, hey, you know, I can get a crew of three or four, or whatever, and take care of the, you know, 
a, a certain significant percentage of our tree work and then just kind of manage the rest contractually. That's where that 25% threshold came from, because that's where the majority of our contractual costs were being allocated. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not a big tree. Yeah. Once you get into bigger trees, you get into bigger equipment, mm -hmm. uh, much, much bigger operations. So I would still foresee. Um, so it's more the equipment that. that's the barrier to the larger trees than the skill of the arborist uh, getting up there, I guess. Equipment and manpower. So yeah. once you get Number into a 40 yeah, yeah. So, if, I mean, if funding were to increase, we find that these in house tree crews are just killing it. Like, it's it's the best service that we can provide. We have experts on our teams. It's great. Then I would look to increasing the number of crews that we have to separate maybe east and west divisions uh, okay. rather than increasing the size because of that, just the risk and liability of mm -hmm. you know owning a crane and trying yeah. to do that kind of operations. Sure. Sure. That's a whole other thing. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions for Crystal? If not, we will need a motion of what we will be recommending to, to council for this amount. And do I have a motion? To so moved. At what level? 31. 31 cents. So you, okay. <laughs> the motion on the floor is to recommend a 31 cents or 0 .30, 0 0.31 per front footage. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. Any other question? Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, team, for the work that you've done there. Yes, sir. I've got some. And um, call upon us for for your assistance or whatever you need as we as we move it forward. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Grant application and acceptance. Craig Sherman. So, commissioners, today I have with the Park from the Parks Foundation a request to apply and accept one hundred two thousand. $674 for six grants. Additionally, I am requesting, we are the Park Staff is requesting us to contribute $12,204 towards the Mount Mary Accessible Center. And the total amount then for the center is $28,204. The $12,204 is in our infrastructure budget and is under the ADA portion. So this is something that will not affect other projects. What is a spinner? <laughs> I, I, I beat you to it. Is it, is it. Is that thing the kids play on? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I assumed that what it was, but I yeah, didn't know so if it was something I'm in the ground. I'm happy to show you a picture of the location. I'm glad you that because that's what I assumed it was. Any questions, comments? I would just say, Again, this is representative of the great support we get from the Cincinnati Parks Foundation. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Yes. Um, if there's no questions, we'll take a motion to approve as recommended. So moved. A second? Second. Move and second that we accept as recommended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And, and thanks again to the foundation. Take that back. Okay, open commissioner discussion comments. Anything that you would like to bring forward, not on the agenda today? Open, open floor. Yes, sir. I would like to make, I would like to wish uh, Tom a happy birthday today. <laughs> 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 it is yes. Mr. John Nyer's birthday. Nowhere else I'd rather celebrate for this fine group of Thank you very much. The, uh, the team was kind to uh, welcome you with some donuts as well. Actually, Which I thoroughly enjoyed. Oh, <laughs> you did. maybe I should recuse myself. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions on these uh, financial reports, Craig. Yep. One is um, I, I always struggle with these reports because they give us a snapshot, but they don't really inform us of a lot more what we plan to do with this. Do we have? Um, where can I find, for instance, in the year to date park board fund balances? We've got availability in each of these funds. Is there is there some document I can reference what our plan is for those dollars? The balances or plans? The balances. So for the balances? Well, I know what the balances are. I mean, the plans for this spending that is fine. As far as like the budget dollars? Uh -huh. The budgeted dollars for those are located on the first 
first page that shows the budget of those restricted dollars and the expenses and the targets. But if you're looking beyond what we budget, like when you look at your uh, revenue, you're, I'm trying to figure out what are we what are we playing this. You want to look at what the projects are? Yeah, I want yeah. to know what we're spending this money on. I don't have, I'm, I'm having a difficult time connecting the dots on our funds and where we're spending the money. Do we have plans to spend this money or is this a static account balance? For those, they do fluctuate with revenue coming in and the expenditures going out, but there is a balance what available is out there. But that's something that we can discuss and look at the details. So looking for a project for me, for me. Are you still looking for a projection? We have X dollars. We're planning to spend Y dollars over the next 90, 180 days, whatever it might be. Well, so for instance, let's just use Cincinnati where we're from park as an example. We had a balance a year ago or at the beginning of the month of $4 million. We've got some money in, we've got some money out, we've got 2.7 million in there. Is this, are these just operating funds we collect revenue and pay expenses over time? Or is that money that we can be looking to for capital expenditures for Cincinnati River Park Park? Uh, yes, yeah, so on that slide, so if we go to, I believe it's slide number one. Page 219. Year to date, what is this one? The model? What page? 119. I'm sorry. So there's a portion over here that says available dollars. So those are looking at informing the commissioners their available dollars when we take away what's budgeted for potential operational, additional operational costs or projects. Each of these funds, when you look at 318, 326, 329, and I'll pick on smell riverfront, which is 329. We have a balance right now full for as of December 1st. A four million eleven thousand. That's available to be spent. No, we have expenditures of one point five million. We have anticipated revenue of being, uh, which projected as a million, and a recommended reserve of eight hundred thousand, resulting in two point seven million available that we can spend on capital needs. Now that can be future capital needs or capital needs. Well, maybe a better way to present it would be just the way you spoke it. Well, it's sort of right here. That's that's right. the bottom of 119. It shows that for these accounts, here's the balance that we have. Here's how much we've budgeted to spend out of it. Here's how much we've budgeted to bring in. This is the reserve okay. balance okay. that we've recommended to keep for a rainy day fund. So the mm -hmm. balance is what is available to be spent. Now, so what that means is that is all money that is not appropriated to a specific what we will spend it on that's what's in the budget expense so this is all money that is not is not earmarked for expenditure but available for expense the only the only other thing that i'll point out though is that there's some funds that you can't spend it on capital if i'm not mistaken we had those funds adjusted that was the sort point fund mm -hmm. and the small front and 326 which is the parcel right region. right those were adjusted last year, so we can't spend them Okay, on so to your question, Molly, we have just on the bottom 119, 7.6 million of dollars available that we could spend in these areas. And some of those are restricted, such as the 318 sort of point is restricted to sort of point. The 329 <laughs> is restricted to snow river front. 330 is restricted to parks, lodges, and buildings. 332 is Chrome. We like to Chrome. restrict it to Chrome, and 403 is the admins code, and 752 is an unrestricted amount, and 326 is an unrestricted amount, meaning they could be spent at any part. So, you know, Director, you're very familiar with asset plans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think as some of these bigger parks is having a real opportunity to approach it from a park perspective. And I know we can, it's, it's, uh, you know, we may be inclined to go down the way of looking at playground equipment separately and looking at lights or however we manage property. But when we look at a big park like Smail, having, I think ha the commissioner is having an understanding of the needs of that park <laughs> from a capital perspective over the next couple of years, also play in this whole concept of prioritization. And to have $2.7 million, and I know Jenny, I brought this up last time, to have 2.7 million available while we've had broken 
uh, fitness equipment for a long time, those are irreconcilable mm -hmm. issues. So that's just where I'm going with. When I review these financial reports, I'm always struggling with what information am I supposed to be deriving from this? And what I really want to know is what needs do we have in our parks and what funding availability do we have to address those needs? And we as a commission, how can we speak into where we match up those two things? And it is definitely very simple concept, but with what we get, it's very hard to arrive at. The aspiration that I'd like to get to is a, a shared language where we have a known set of conditions through the infrastructure report. Those are judged against a series of priorities that's established by the commissioners and then compared with resources as indicated here and other places that they're those can live in as few a set of documents as possible. Ideally one, I'm not sure if that's realistic or not, but I agree that we can get that information consolidated so that we know that. I'm making up numbers. We have a half million dollars of short term needs for improvements at Snow River Park, and we have money to do that. Let's proceed to convert that potential funds into actual improvements made at the parks. Is that, a, yes. is that an aspiration that matches the board's pleasure? It's sort of, it's very strongly thinly outlined at that point, but developing along that. Right. Yeah, well, it, that dovetails into we've got this infrastructure report. So that does show us by part, by type, by, by, by line item, where we need money over the next few years. What it doesn't encompass and what we don't see is, to Molly's point, the operational re maintenance, that's maintenance and repair. If a, if a, if a piece of equipment or, or if it's going to be replaced, then it becomes capital, obviously. But uh, some of that should show up on the, the capital uh, infrastructure report we did but that's our starting point and this number here the seven million or whatever it was just comes into play as we're thinking about long term how are we going to fund that capital need Absolutely. um but yeah. but we don't have a strategy for that yet and no. that's what we're talking about right, right. one other question i staff in summer Rock is in here. I asked Rock a question about this last night. I was trying to figure out what I was looking for how a new director position was going to get posted. And I got linked up to Geo Geo and <laughs> whatever that is. I was there. And when I plugged in parks, I can't find any positions that are open. And I know we've talked a lot about, you know, it's hard to get stuff done when you're short staffed by 25 people, which is what this report shows us. So I see a lot of holding and do we have these positions posted? Are people applying for them? Where are these? Jane can speak to that also. We are doing a review and I can also speak that of some of these positions. So even though we did have some uh, rules in there, we would like to change some of these to something that would be more beneficial to the point board. So there are, are different steps at different levels in order to get to uh, the actual posting um, of a position. And, and that is what you see when you go and say, jobs with the city, what is posted, right? So um, what I've been trying to do here, which I know is probably a foreign language because you're not familiar with those steps, how to get to that point is try to tell you where they are in that process. Okay. Yes, there is a NeoGov system, which is where all city postings go to get posted. But there is a back end to that. And I kind of took John through this on like, I stopped day. taking pages at a, yeah. I stopped taking notes at an entire page. <laughs> Positively Byzantine. So I'm not going to go through the entire thing. I am going to try to streamline it, but I think it was our very first conversation. I ended up getting to all the steps that I think I overwhelmed him. I was actually hoping he was going to return to the next thing. <laughs> I didn't want to be the responsible one to say, sorry. <laughs> But um, so some of these positions that you see on here that are holding, those were positions that we um, originally, when we submitted fiscal year 22, as holding them as our um, vacant 
PVA requirement positions. Um, PVA stands for position vacancy allowance. allowance. Thank you. <laughs> and so those were the original uh, positions that we've decided to hold back for um, those purposes. However, uh, internally, uh, we have certainly discussed the need to maybe change the title of these positions or the classifications of these positions in order to function better for parks. We have not yet had that conversation with John uh, to the level for him to understand what that is. And we are certainly gathering those, what our needs and wants are to see if this can function. Unfortunately, uh, part of this uh, system does matter what union it's in. If the union would approve it, if civil service would approve changing those positions over to the title we want, or do we move forward with um, new positions being placed on the budget for fiscal year 23? What is the best avenue for us? So the ones that you see holding on there, that's why it's considered holding. It's, so um, are you saying the, the rest of these are posted somewhere? So either they have been posted or they have been gone through, they have gone through the back end, what I call that um, process in order to get them posted. So in order to get a position posted, right now I fill out the requisition with all the duties, what fund it's coming out of, everything else. That goes through a seven step approval. It goes through, a, a, <laughs> sorry. And each one's a different city department. It, are you laughing yes. because it makes you want to cry? No, I was laughing because I was trying not to giggle by your, your facial response. <laughs> Trying to not respond to that, but I, I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't hold it back. Um, so it goes through central HR, it goes through the director, it goes through central HR, goes through three different budget processes, and then it sits in the vacancy review board, which uh, is a organization that reviews to make sure your position really is vacant, to make sure that it is in, you know, certainly with the same, you know, uh, information you've provided on the requisition meets the actual vacancy. And um, at that point, after it gets through the vacancy review board, which only meets once a month, so you go through all six steps initially, it then goes through the vacancy review. Once it gets through vacancy review, then it comes back to us to say, okay, now you can post it. Once it gets posted, you have to post it for at least two weeks, depending on what position is sometimes we have to do that later, then all the candidates come in. Then it comes back to our departmental HR liaison, which is right now me. And I uh, have to vet each individual to make sure that they have met the qualifications. Gets placed on an eligible list. Then you're ready to interview. Once you then interview, you can offer a position. If they accept, it then goes back to the Civil Service Board for approval to make sure that everything was sufficient with your offer. They pass, sometimes pass background check, drug screen, depending on the position, promotion, new person, just depending. And then once it gets through the Civil Service, that's when you're actually to start the employees. So when you see these on here, they are at different steps. And unfortunately, because my full focus uh, cannot be HR at this moment, it is taking a lot longer than. So I understand this rabbit hole goes to Cuba. That's what I've got from your. <laughs> this Cuba. Two questions. Yes. What, what is the status on the HR manager? Because yes. it's clear that we need one. Yes. And the status on the division manager for planning and design. So the status on the HR manager, the uh, central HR actually helped me in vetting all those uh, candidates. So those were available on an eligible list on Thursday. So now I am moving forward to uh, set up interviews for those candidates. So that one should be settled very soon. How many? How many candidates? Okay. Originally there were 48. Uh, after the vetting purpose, I believe there, I'm not, I don't have an exact number, but I'm going to guesstimate from looking at the list about 18. 18. Out of those. And then the division um, manager of planning and design that is also that closed um, on maybe the 4th or 5th of December. Okay. And so I am in the process of vetting those individuals for their eligibility and then can move forward with 
uh, scheduling interviews for those. So Can you tell us how many you got there? I believe it's around 25. <laughs> and I haven't, I, I don't know if they're it. all eligible. They're not, so they're they're not right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Gotcha. So, yes. so the 18 number on the HR, yes. that's vetted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then how do you get that number down? So to what I can do it. is take uh, whomever I want. Because of this position, there are rules with different positions. But this is uh, not a um, union position. So I can take whoever I need to. Um, on the um, whoever I look at those 18, I can look at all the resumes and um, select who I want to interview off of that list. All by yourself? Well, not, yes. I mean, who, do, who yes, else do you know? Who I else have a committee for the interview? Yeah, okay, no, thanks. I would anticipate being a part of that uh, the committee center for, for those positions, which I think yeah. are direct reports that way. And, and uh, I just want to commend Deputy Director Mobley for. That is a big lift for a lot of months that you have been doing, and I appreciate you stepping into that. And I'm pleased that I think things are advancing. Uh, I, I don't want to predict an exact timeline, but I think it is. Uh, we're in the last quartile of a higher of filling uh, at least a couple of very prominent and and vacancies that are really filled positions. So uh, please, if that's in good motion. Is it like football where it's a two minute warning and it's <laughs> half an hour later? <laughs> it's really yeah. over. Mindful of the Bengals' last game. I think it is a, an immensely complex, as it should be, to make sure we have qualified candidates, but it, but it, but it is that there, there are those of us who have lived more in the private sector. Uh, it does take some adjusting to understand what the process is in this environment. and. We are working uh, as well as can be conceived in that process, but it is a different process. And I would fully have the expectation of um, the uh, HR manager to be able to move this forward at a much faster pace. Um, that will be their focus. Yes. And Jenny, one question I had on the staffing summary report yes. forever. Does this include seasonal employees? This does not include seasonal. This is just full time. So give us a clue. How many seasonal employees are in a budget like for right now, December 1st or whatever we are? December 1st, uh, our season pretty much has come to a close. We usually um, have our seasonal employees from March through October. Okay. Which that is approximately around 100 employees. Okay. At this time, these are really, really rough estimates, but at this time, we probably have maybe 40 seasonal employees and, or less. And do we, do we have a vacancy there? Because that's been one concern that I've had besides these 25. Mm -hmm. I think throughout this past year, we've had significant seasonal vacancies mm -hmm. as well. Yes, it was difficult this year to hire some um, seasonal employees. It was difficult to get them through yeah. um, a lot of the background checks and pre-employment requirements. So as we said today, do we have vacancies that we're trying to fill today for seasonal? We do. At this time, I do not believe we are Good. looking for any seasonals. Good. We will ramp that back up. We will probably put that posting out end of January, beginning of February, and we're going gotcha. to get them through for March and April. Yep. And, and I might just add to that because we'll we will help uh, promote those positions each season. Um, we had a lot of trouble this year just because of the job market and the, what the salary range is for those positions. And I anticipate it's going to be even more difficult this year. Just to track this and the wages that are going to So, yeah, so what kind of role is that? We're going to be even more responsible. Because that is the turn of water going into next season, is where some of these uh, seasonals make 12 or 13 dollars an hour and your senior rate is above 15 or above. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, is, is the process the same for seasonal? Do you have to go? Uh, it does not have to go through that seven uh, step approval. Okay. It only goes to like a three step approval. It's not. Um, <laughs> It's not as difficult. No. That's four steps. Um, so it, it can go at a <laughs> four steps. That's right. We just took that giant leap. So, uh, but it, it is a, uh, a task that I am hoping the HR is all ready to go for and in place to get 
the additional 100 seasonal employees on board. Hopefully because yes, they do still yeah. have to go through right. drug screening pre employment, yeah. and that's a whole thing that I haven't even process that I haven't even described here. So, how, how do you go about getting an increase for the seasonal uh, salary? That's, uh, that's where I'm reaching out to administration because. Traditionally, if you have an increase in your salary, you're only given provided a certain dollar amount for seasonal salaries. So if you increase your salary amount hourly rate, you have to decrease your seasonal headcount. So what we're reaching out to administration for is, is citywide looking at increasing the seasonal staff's hourly, hourly rate and then providing that budget. Because you're going to go through months. that with CRC too, right? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, we are, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so hopefully somebody recognizes that what was real a year or two ago is not even in the ballpark, yeah. you know, next year. Yeah. They are aware of it. Okay, good. So. Uh, and then you start to see some of the lower uh, classifications for the practice and like your labor is being paid on those equal rate to the season employees. So then those positions see. Yeah, you have that compression that yeah. we got yeah. to respond to. So it's a right. best of luck. Okay. So how long, how long does it take typically to hire? Somebody with a seven step layer cake versus a three step. I, I would say it at least takes, I would say, two months, 60 days. Okay. Well, that's that's best case. Case. That, that, case. Case. that would that's be my guess. Best. It probably would be best case scenario. Yeah, right? yeah. Worst, 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 case yeah. worst case scenario would, well, worst case scenario, you don't get it. Right? Well we're in right <laughs> you guys are doing a good job. Oh, wow. Despite the hands you felt, right? Okay. Any one other item. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. You know what? I'm on I'm on this thing. So I realize as I'm sitting here and thinking about what I'm going to say, but Mary, I've never said your last name out loud. So I think it's Hunter Iron. Yes, that's correct. Yes. <laughs> that was good. So for those of you that don't know, Mary has been working with the park board for three years and has really helped facilitate productive meetings and has kept us on task. You've been just an instrumental person at the parks. And you're now leaving us to go to this great city of Durham, who's very lucky to have you. And I'm sure that you will contribute to their parks. And we hope you remember our parks. I have a gift for you. We'll never forget the parks here. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, what's your favorite park? Um, I like Washington. I like oh. Washington Park too. Well, this won't be your favorite park, <laughs> but it is a park that definitely um, is indicative of the your so, tenure here at Cincinnati Parks, which is a gorgeous watercolor by local artist Adele Domeno, who I know well, of Burnett Woods. Gorgeous. Isn't that gorgeous? The lake. It is. Yeah. Terrific. So Mary, we'd like to present this to you oh, as a token gosh. of remembrance of your time at Cincinnati Parks. That is so nice. <laughs> gorgeous. This is you know, one of those sure. mice. Luminous. It's very beautiful. Thank you so much. We will Thank all miss you. you. Oh, yeah. I yes. miss you too. But you will have better weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's degrees degrees. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but this is tornado weather. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other um, commissioner items you want to bring up? We still have staff. Uh, Rocky, you got uh, something quick? It's been a long meeting, so I promise I'll be brief. Uh, I, do, I do have to add, though, to that last discussion. We've talked about our part time staff and our recreation specialists, as we call them. Um, it is a great program. It's a, it's a job entering, job training opportunity. Miss mm -hmm. Mobley herself began her journey with the city as a recreation specialist oh. and has risen all through the ranks, all the accepting directors. So, and there's, a, there's many, many stories like that within parks. People started out at that level. So, we do want to get that right. Uh, so, very quickly, I uh, just wanted to mention to you that um, we are once again, along with the Audubon Society, participating in the annual bird Christmas count. Um, so anybody that's a lot of fun for families to do over break or individuals, anybody interested, uh, they essentially would go out, volunteers go out, help uh, count birds so they can um, properly represent what's here 
and it can only happen with volunteers. So anybody out there interested, uh, please visit our website or social media and sign up. Um, December 19th and December 26th from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and then finally, um, we just wanted to recognize, pass that around since our screen's broken. Um, our Christian, district crew leader of Green Space, Ann Allman, was selected as the Cincinnati Parks Employee of the Year this year uh, in a ceremony last week. Um, we were proud to celebrate with her, uh, Mr. Nyer, on his hashtag. <laughs> uh, I participated, and you can see the pictures. There's one in the back as well with the city manager. And um, you know, this is a great opportunity just to sort of put a plug in for Green Space. Which is in Crystal Shop. And Crystal, yeah, that's great. They are dedicated to beautifying many of the public green spaces in our business districts, downtown, our main arteries, traffic islands, a lot of the things that people come to expect when they drive around our city and see these beautiful public mm -hmm. spaces. It's easy, honestly, to take them for granted. Anne Allman and really her whole team is absolutely dedicated to impressing with their spaces. And so uh, we wanted to recognize and acknowledge her work. And also for the award that she received. Yeah, see what I'm So congratulations. That's I would just want to make one comment. How do we <clears throat> thank the guy that does the mowing, the guy that does the weed pulling? How do we recognize each of those individuals yearly? How do we say thank you? How do how do we let them know that they are as important as you? Well, thank you. But if you think so, we should talk to my wife about that. <laughs> um, we, you know, it's an area that we were always looking to improve in. But um, in my time here, we've started a regular practice of highlighting individuals sort of at the boots level through all of our digital media. So um, on our website, through social media stories and through videos, we regularly feature folks as they're out there in the field of working. Um, and that's something that will continue. Um, we've had uh, conversations with you know with directors. I know we had some some plans in the works with Kara on ways to bolster that um, appreciation, and uh, we'll be looking to add to that as we move forward. I know that um, we've we've uh, been in discussions now about trying to do some sort of holiday um, appreciation luncheon for the staff. We're trying to get that pulled together now. If I can offer a, a, a quick observation in my, my first week here, that a great thing is the, the division managers whom this rolls up to, they recognize that uh, that their teams are responsible for all, all of our success. So that's that's a, a, a foundational thing for at least to realize. People understand that uh, there is a lot of we, there's not a lot of I. And I think that's really important culture. We don't have quite the latitude you might like to do things you do in, in other kind of environments, but folks get it and, and just in, in very short time here already, you can see that folks appreciate your teams and that's that's at least the start. You're, you're working from a good place to start. It's a good point. We can't, there's no bonus structure or anything like that within the city. So we just try to find other ways with our teams to do that recognition. I, I've been working with Jenny. We're, we're trying to pull one thing that we, we've talked about is just how, how do we do that? So I've been trying to get an all staff meeting for next week before the holiday, uh, where we hope to have presented a lunch and just an opportunity for the people to interact. Hopefully any of us that could be there, but uh, management be there so that we can give an opportunity for questions, but just as an opportunity to say thank you for another year of hard work. Um, we're waiting to hear back. I, I was told uh, Kevin in the law department's trying to sort out if we are able to provide food. Um, to for an event like that. So that's still up in the air. So we're hoping to pull that together quickly. And we can't come together in the, in the nine days between uh, now and the holiday that many people celebrate about golf. But a, if we can't get that together, there's still an opportunity to do it, I think, in the new year. I, I, it's, it's okay to, uh, if that becomes a push that can't happen, I, I think it's okay as long as we don't lose sight of it. And, Next December, saying, Did we ever do anything that way? Yeah, so I think there's, yeah, and, that, and I should mention that's been, traditionally the practice had been here to do a beginning of season meeting with all staff where we pull everybody together and all the new uh, seasonals and thank everybody and provide lunch, etc. That has not happened the last couple of years prior to COVID. Um, but we've looked at doing that various times. So I think to your point, that is, that's also a date we can look 
sort of usually mark March, late March, early April, so we're gearing up for the season. Okay. But I like that idea because uh, I think it could serve two purposes. You could say, thanks for the great year we just come through, and then be inspiring about what we're going to get accomplished in the coming year. So really and we have a little bit of planning, so more of us can be there because yeah. then we do something next week. Yeah. Yeah. And Jim, this is Kevin. I can talk to you immediately after this meeting if you have a second. Okay. Who is that? Just that was Kevin. That was Kevin, 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 Kevin Frank. Oh. <laughs> He's going to chastise you. Whatever he just said. <laughs> um, right, thanks. Go I have one very brief thing. Yes. Our, uh, our friends at, on the team at Crone uh, were able to provide some poinsettias uh, for the meeting today, and uh, we would appreciate it if the commissioners would uh, take one with you through your holiday oh. celebrations. So, oh, uh, from, the, uh, from the lovely team at Crone. So, thank you very much. And go see the Crone exhibit. It's beautiful. It's absolutely stunning this year. Anything else to come before the board? Well, then we will adjourn, even without an, a motion, we will adjourn for the year and see everybody back uh, in January. Jingle bells, everybody. Yes. Who gave us these? Oh, it's Jim. Yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, you're welcome.